But keep our kimonos on. That's right. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Dan Bull coming at you from 65 Amps in North Hollywood. Today is 7-Eleven which is quite a lucky day uh, numerically, but it's also my lucky day today because I am so honored and thrilled to have Ken Scott here uh, in my office with me. And for those of you that don't know Ken Scott, this is probably one of the people you could count on your hands that have made a huge impact in the music business. And we'll go over his resume uh, here shortly. And he's also got a book that he's just released, which I'm gonna dive into today. Uh, very nice. But anyway, first off, thank you, Ken. I'm so pleased thank to have you, you here. It's, it's good to be here. I'm with all of you. Yeah, right on. So for those of you that don't know Ken, uh, Ken got his start at a little studio in London called EMI. And he used to work with some northerners called the Beatles. And EMI also has the name Abbey Road attached to it, to yes. most people. Oh, Abbey Road. Yeah, that's yes. right. Yes. And uh, yeah, well, if we're going to be picky... Yeah, and here's a couple of drinks. This is Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. Hey, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, yeah, EMI Abbey Road, and um, so uh, I don't even know where to start. I'm trying not to be Chris Farley from Saturday Night Live. You know, like, remember, did you ever see the one where he talked to Paul McCartney? And he goes, "Yeah, remember, remember when you played with the Beatles and you did? Yeah, yeah, that was awesome." Uh, and then he says, so is it true when you say the love that you give is equal, the love that you take is equal? Like, yeah, it is. Awesome. <laughs> so um, we're going to have some fun. So I'm a like a medium level Beatles nerd. So I've been familiar with your work through that. And then um, as I bought Brian's book and I've seen your name on a dozens of albums that I own. And um, so I relish the chance to sit here and maybe have more of a technical discussion. To a point, I'm not overly technical. That's yeah. not the way we were trained at EMI. This yeah. is something that's that's sort of come on later. We would we had the amp room guys upstairs, so anything that went wrong, yeah. we just call them. We we were there to get the sounds to deal with that. So right. We, we weren't supposed to know the. <laughs> they didn't want you to. Now, what color coat did you wear when you started? I, I know there was a color coding system, right? Yeah, no, there, there were two coats. There were brown coats and there were white coats. Oh, so is that all? Yes, okay. Yes. The brown coats were the studio uh, roadies. They oh, were okay. The guys that would help all the musicians in with their gear set up for a huge orchestral session or the jazz right. and all that. The white coats were the amp room guys, and they wore those mainly because they had to be well dressed underneath the white coats. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with some of the echo chambers, which weren't particularly clean and rolling ah. around under everything, you'd get dirty. So they had to wear white coats. Oh, the rest nice. of us engineers had to wear suits and ties, and uh, yeah. button pushers, second engineers had to be relatively well dressed. You could never wear jeans or anything like that, and you had to wear a tie. Yeah. Wow, what a different world it was, huh? Oh, yeah. That's so great. So now you're from London originally, yeah. right? Um, I'm listening, I used to live in London, so I'm guessing you're south. Southeast, very good. Southeast I, I was, Kent, or were no, you in no, London? No, southeast London. Southeast was, London. Yeah, on the okay. Of Kent, oh, okay. But uh, I was born a Cockney. I was born uh, in Charing Cross Hospital, which is uh, we, if they'd been there at the time within the sound of the Bow Bells. Yeah, been, yeah. They'd been taken out for the war. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. So, yeah. yeah, I lived in Fulham. Okay. I was SW6 right there yep. at Putney Bridge yep. for a long time. And uh, I was playing music over there. And I always say, until I had my children, it was the best time of my life. I was absolutely fantastic. I My mother's side of the family are pretty recent English immigrants, and they just never, I never heard anything about it. So I just decided to go move there and see how long I could go before I got kicked out because I was working illegally. But. Oh. I was uh, driving a little sandwich lorry during the day and uh, playing, music playing I was in two different bands. Don't you find that over there, uh, uh, there was, and I think there still is, there's more opportunity for bands to, for people to play. Absolutely. And actually make a, make a little bit of money. You could actually be a professional yeah. over there just doing the pub circuit. That's all I did. Yeah. And you know, you'd get, you'd get pub grub and all the beer you could drink and yeah. I'd walk out with yeah, 40 pounds or something right. net. And do that every night and yeah. you can actually live. You, you oh, yeah. don't have to have the day job if you want to really sort of. Yeah. Two of my gigs were in, were then walking distance. That's how much live music. I used to play at the old Kingshead pub on yeah. Putney High Street yeah. right over the bridge. 
and then the slug and the lettuce at the Fulham uh, train right. at the Fulham Memphis tube stop. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but I used to I have some funny London stories I'll share because since you're a Londoner and you imagine this young kid from America trying to do everything like yeah a lot of our amps are named after British themes from when I was there but one of them is the Soho and I knew that MPL Productions was in Soho Square which is Paul McCartney's yep. business office. And I went and had lunch there because I drove the little Sandy truck, you know. And I'd sit there and eat a few sandwiches every afternoon in Soho Square, hoping that I would see Paul, <laughs> right? And I never did. I mean, in like two years, I sat there and I tried to go in and sell them our food. And, and then finally, someone said, hey, idiot, there's a subterranean entrance in the back. You know, he doesn't just walk in the front door. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> But the interesting thing is how times change. I, I guess that there were no girls hanging out in the front there or anything. No, uh -uh. Which, not too long before that, anywhere, like Apple always used to have yeah. outside Abbey Road, of course. Yeah, yeah. And just, it's, they became just part of the establishment. Of oh, yeah. Games. Well, there's a couple of wonderful stories um, that uh, books I've read from your co workers, like Jeff Emmerich, about uh, girls breaking into Abbey Road. Yeah, it, it's interesting because that did happen once, but everyone has a different version of, of that story and when it actually happened. So it, you're, it's one, interesting. you're one step ahead of me because I was okay. going to say, because Jeff is a great storyteller and um, and they're really, but when I was reading the book, I'm like, there's no way he remembers all this stuff. And I'm sure, you know, some editor said, hey, let's let's add some body let's to this. It up. Yes. But the story that I, the one that I love the most and I think this might predate you maybe was when they're doing She Loves You and they'd done 25 takes and no one was feeling it and they just didn't have any energy and a bunch of girls broke in and they were lifting up their shirts and pressing their goods on the window in the studio and while they were doing a take and it livened up the band they all got excited and they got this really hyped up take and so what they're playing to is a background of half-naked girls up against the window with a bobby chasing them, you know, trying to club them over the head. And that's how they got the good take. To me, that sounded... Yeah. <laughs> Knowing even the situation that, that uh, someone would be allowed to even stand there still for a moment and not be chased out immediately. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't just that the Beatles were there, but you've got classical artists, people doing that. They don't want nonsense going on there because the people paying... Lots of money to be there working quietly and so forth. Right. Well, I, it's implausible that it happened. Well, my yeah, my impression of Abbey Road is that it's a hyper professional atmosphere. Yes. You During know, more, more, uh, yeah, yeah, back back then, absolutely, one hundred percent. It ran like a business office. It, well, it, that's what it was, mm -hmm. but it was a very strange business office because it was never allowed to make a profit. <laughs> it it was it was basically. Uh, a tax loss for EMI because EMI were a huge electronics uh, company. Yeah, they, they made more money from uh, doing radar and things for the Ministry of Defence and all of that kind of mm. thing than they ever dreamt of with with the Beatles. But uh, so the the way EMI studios used to be run was uh, you wouldn't get sort of a list of recording expenses at the end of a session. The the act wouldn't. It would be left until the end of the financial year. They'd see how much, how many people had been in. They'd split it all up so that everything eventually zeroed out. So <laughs> it, it was that much of a business kind of thing. It, wow, it was weird. It so was they very strange. They were a small cog in the in the machine of EMI. Oh, absolutely. And, wow, fascinating. Yeah, because you know we all revere this place as the hallowed halls, and it, it's ama within our industry. It is amazing. There, I go over there as frequently as I can. I love going in there. And whenever I stand at the top of the stairs of Number Two Studio, just mm -hmm. the hair on the back of my neck stands up. Yeah. Just there is something about it, isn't there? That, that, it's impossible to put it into words. Mm -hmm. it just there's a feeling there that of I've, of its history. I've heard that from a lot of people that don't believe in anything metaphysical. Yeah. But they walk into that room and the hair stands up. Yeah. And no, nothing's going on. The lights aren't even on. They just stand there and it's just whatever collective music memory we all have comes yeah. comes alive out of that room. Yeah. Now keep in mind that Abbey Road as we know it is the home of the Beatles, but it it's also a fragment of what oh, yeah. went on there. So kids yeah. would do sessions not just with rock and roll bands, but all kinds of odd things. Yeah. Well, in number 2 I did Lord Sitar, which everyone always <laughs> thought was was George, but uh, it was uh, 
an English session, session guitarist called uh, called uh, I, 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 I've forgotten. Vic? No, it wasn't Vic Flick. It was uh, big, 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 big Jim Sullivan. Big oh, Jim. really? He, wow. He, yeah, he'd learned to play sitar, and some bright spark at EMI decided that, uh, <laughs> well, let's cash in on the whole sitar craze, and they just had him play Anything? classical, oh, uh, uh, classic rock songs and all of that at the time. With wow. Uh, orchestral backing. It was very strange. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, who's the other guy? Um, Lord, uh, we were talking oh, about him. Screaming Lord Such. Oh, screaming Lord <laughs> Such, oh. yeah. Different, but similar. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's also, you know, there, because there's comedy there, and there's all these, there's classical recordings going on, and, and almost big band or, or crooner type things going. So there's so much of a depth of perspective that also influences who's walking in to record a Beatles album, too. That it wasn't just rock and roll all the time. But yet the Beatles wanted to pull an influence from sound effects or a strange tone from the 1920s and 40s, you could get that sound too, because these people were trained to do all those things. Well, yeah, that, that to me was part of the, the amazing training of that place that isn't available today at any studio, I don't think. And that's, you got to sit in there next to three of the, the best pop engineers of, all, of, of the time, four of the best pop engineers at the time, and three of the best classical engineers at the time. Yeah. And you, you got to watch the different mics they used, the different positioning, how classical was different to, to rock, which was different to the, the sort of more band, dance band oriented stuff. Mm -hmm. all, and it all collects back there. So at some point it, it sort of comes up to the front. It's, hey, I, I remember when Chris Parker used to do it that way. Why didn't I try it that yeah. way kind of thing? Sure. It, it's amazing. You have a story about um, people working with old tapes and taking out clicks and how you'd learn oh. that trick, which I thought was it was very helpful because I used it the next day after you told oh, me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was uh, one of the the old timers there had been just given a given a job because it was back in the time when when you started to work for a company, you yes. worked there till retirement. You were a lifer, yeah. Yes. And he'd been he'd been given this this job of transferring seventy eights onto tape. <laughs> to to preserve them to yeah yeah archive do, yes. yeah and look of course the problem was there were lots of clicks on them and this was before computers so there wasn't the programming to get rid of it yeah you couldn't that. look so, at it on a screen yeah, and yeah, clip it right. out right so the way he used to do it he he would treat each click as if it's an edit he'd rock the tape backwards and forwards find where the click is mark it take the tape off and then he'd take a small segment of, of splicing tape, quarter inch splicing tape, and he'd put it on the oxide side of the tape. Yeah, yeah. Which would cause a dropout, just a minute uh, dropout. Yeah, for a microsecond, yeah. yeah. And the click would no longer be there. Wow. And what Brian was, was talking about was when I was doing a Salty Dog, Procol Harum album, mm -hmm. uh, Dave Knight, the, the bass player, for some reason on this one particular number, and I can't remember which one it was, every time he took his fingers off the, the strings and then put them back on again, there'd be a click. And so we, we got a great take, but it has all these clicks on the bass. So oh. event, it was, how do we do this? So I did what Gadsby Tony, the guy I was talking about, uh, did. I'd go through, I'd find each click. And oh then my gosh. Put, but this was on, uh, I think it was probably eight track tape by then. So it's not- Two inch. Is it, uh, yeah, two yeah. inch. So you literally had to find the uh, the track as well, and Mark oh. and just get it on that track. But How tedious well. is that? How oh, long would something like that take? Oh, it, it took a couple of hours. Oh, is that all? Oh, wow. Yeah. You you are a master. Oh, you had to. That would take me two weeks. Oh. <laughs> but it also saved the take because it was a live performance. Oh yeah. And it yeah. saved the take, and it, it's something that's very easy to do now, but almost impossible to do then by any other means. Sure. It's a very simple thing, but you learn from someone who had taught that. And then just the next day or two, I was in the studio and someone had a, a track recorded on tape and the snare drum mic had been fine before, but something went wrong on a take and it was going <laughs> every once in a while, just randomly during the song. Oh, nice. And we used the same trick and it worked. Wow. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Those old times were amazing. We, lo we have lost so much from no one interviewing them or videoing them and all of that. Back yeah, was, everyone sort of was, took it for granted, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. Well, no one was interested. Wow. It wasn't even taking it for granted. It's just no one was interested. Yeah. There's a perspective that there were no recording magazines. There would be yeah. occasionally be an article on a whole studio, but not much in the way of detail or technical stuff. 
And so compared to today, there was not a guitar magazine even. Mm -hmm. You know, there was nothing to do with amplifiers or even recording techniques. Well, that's Most right. People would never get to record. Why would there be a magazine about that? Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of amazing though um, when you think about the level of handwork and the level of actual expertise it took to create an album compared to being able to flip open Pro Tools now. And it was different. I mean, it's a twofold thing, you know, because it lets everyone express themselves musically, and it <coughs> lets everyone express themselves <laughs> musically. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. But I mean, it does give everyone more freedom, and I, you know, I, there's a lot of arguments there about why we have 45 segments of pop music now instead of three. You know, there used to be rock and roll and R and B and country, and that was about yeah. it. <clears throat> but. Um, it's very fun. Now, so I don't want to dwell on stuff that you're tired of talking about because I'm sure you get these same questions all the oh, time. Oh, it's fine. I'm, you I'm, sure? I'm, okay. For the longest time, I wasn't interested in talking about my past. It yeah. Was, it was very much the next project, the next project, next project. Yeah. Then I was working on a Duran album and I had to go to the most ridiculous thing in the world. I had to do a, a quick acoustic guitar overdub which I knew would take 15 minutes yeah unfortunately the guitarist Warren Cucurillo was in London and they said to me where would you like to do it and I just one of those I was joking they said oh how about number two Abbey Road <laughs> flew me over first class the whole thing it took 15 minutes nice and yeah I know yeah absolute talk about throwing money away at ridiculous but that's they, the they old version of the record business yes, yeah right. yes. yeah but uh Whilst I was there, the maintenance engineer that was working that day, a gentleman by the name of Brian Gibson, who both Brian and I know very well, mm -hmm. uh, he came up to me after the session. He said, I chose to work today so that we could talk. Because he started there around about the same time as I did, but he was one of the, the lifers, basically. Yeah, yeah. And he said, do you remember when we used to hear all of these amazing stories from, from the old timers? Absolutely, that yeah. was incredible. We said, well, we've now become the old timers. The, the next generation want to hear our stories. And yeah, that, that got me thinking. Then I got to work with, uh, I can't remember the order that went in, but I got to work with George Harrison again on All Things Was Passed. That's and, right. And that kind of thing. And then uh, doing 5.1 of Ziggy. Mm -hmm. And that, my past was, all, it was biting my ass, basically. And so <laughs> I had to start thinking about it. And the first thing that happened was uh, putting together talks that I do from time to time. For yeah. Universities and around. Well, for someone and, my age, it's incredibly fascinating. And I can listen to these stories endlessly. Yeah. But then within that, I, it's, I've got used to talking about it. So I, I, I don't mind the questions. Okay. Well, good. Well, you know, I, I, I saw an interview with, with Paul McCartney once when I was young. And it really made it a made an uh, impression on me, the interviewer asked him, is there any question that you haven't been asked yet? And he said, not that one. Right. <laughs> I, you know, and it's, you know, so I want to try to not dwell on the stuff that uh, is bad. Well, I mean, uh, we'll get to your book here in a minute because we got enough people here. For those of you that can't see this very well, Ryan, yeah, if you can hold that up. And uh, I've been reading about this coming out. There's a great picture on the back there as well. And... Um, me with George doing all things as pass. What a what an incredible honor that must be have been. Oh well, talk talk about taking things for granted. It, it was just it another was, gig yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna work with Harrison what? today. Whatever, yeah, you know. Absolutely. Me and Presley and the Queen are gonna go out for tea. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. There's a amazing pictures in the book. I love to see the photos as well. That's half the reason to buy a book in some cases. Pictures Ken took of a Beatles session. Oh, yeah. 1964-ish. Yep. Very nice. So, yeah, if we could kind of start there for a minute. And if you remember the detail of when the phone rang and somebody said, so tomorrow you're going to go do Hard Day's Night. Well... How do you mean that I'd already started working there and then yeah, I, I but, moved down? But to, when you when you got the call, like you're going to be in the room with George, Harris, I mean with George Martin, and well, it, it was the, the way my life has gone. I was promoted from working in the tape library to become a button pusher. And was Norman Harris the first? Then? Norm, Norman Smith. Norman Smith. I'm sorry. Yeah, pardon me. I'm thinking Buddy Holly's bass player. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, was it Norm Norman, Norman Smith? Yeah, well, is, with uh, Hard Day's Night, I was just second engineer, and it was side two of Hard Day's Night. Uh, 
And back then you didn't hang out with them that much because the multi-track machines were in a different room. Yeah. EMI only had two four tracks at that point for three studios. So mm -hmm. they had it so they could be plugged plugged up anywhere. Plus they were huge back then. Then they yeah. started to get the studers and then they were in the control room. And ah, okay. That's when you really got to start to hang out with them. But it's a strange thing if you're imagining I could be recording with the Beatles. Yes, but you'd be not even in the control room with George Martin. Right. Down the hallway yeah. in a closet basically with no window, and here's the little speaker where they say, push record now, and you could hear a little bit of music coming off the tape machine, but it was only one track, one track you could yes. listen to. You had to choose which track you were going to hear. Wow, so you get to listen to the mistakes and all, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I would imagine, you know, if you're down the hall in a room by yourself on long sessions, maybe there's a lot of time for mischief. <laughs> not at Abbey Road, not on EMI at that point. No, you sat there and you took care of business. It, it was, yeah, that, that's the way. Very it was. professional. I, I, when you were working, yes. See, you know, we all of us later rock and roll musicians are so flummoxed by this professionality. Yeah, because it just doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe you when people do. are working with you, because. They respect well, you, but well, one of the things you have to remember now, it, this wasn't the case for the Beatles, but at least it was to start with, and then they slowly changed it. But the recording deals back then, the artist had to do one album every six months. Yeah. So you had to be professional. There was no room yeah. for, for messing around. There was a work you ethic. Fun. Yeah, you yeah. had fun. Right. You had a lot of fun. Absolutely. But you also, you had to... You had to walk the walk, yeah. yeah. yeah two, that's... two weeks to record, and then generally I'd take two weeks to mix. So during that time when you, you were starting to uh, get in on Beatles sessions, who else were you working with? I mean, that... Oh, Ju that we... Judy, Judy Garland. Uh, wow. Daniel Barenboim. Uh, Manfred Mann, my first number one single uh, as a second engineer was Do Wa Diddy. Do Wa Diddy, wow. Uh, Peter Sellers mm -hmm. did some work with him, which was fascinating. It, never actually sort of discovered who he was because mm -hmm. every time he would talk it would be one of his characters yeah and he changed the voices every sort of comment it was, yeah it was absolutely bizarre i've heard absolutely i've bizarre. read other things about him that he was quite an enigma yeah very but, strange. but a, a brilliant guy yeah. but troubled i guess yeah. is the right way to say it you know oh. trying to find out trying to find happiness somewhere yeah i guess very interesting i love that let's see if we're missing any questions here no i think everybody's in shock they're loving it. Well, we'll get to sort of question and answer stuff here um, in a little while. Um, so, so the the next jump uh, for Beatles nerds for us is you, you get the call that hey, we need a first engineer for Mystery Tour, right? Not quite. Not quite. Okay. Well, I, I, after the, the training at EMI was, you go from. Uh, Second engineer, button pusher, you, you have to learn to master. Mm -hmm. uh, because the management knew that it was easier to get stuff onto tape than it was onto vinyl. So they felt before you became an engineer, you should learn the final thing that's going to be yeah. very hard. Yeah, yeah. On vinyl. So you master. Then if, if you're lucky, you get the phone call. Now, the, the person before me that got the phone call was Jeff Emmerich. Right. Uh, he was an engineer for six months and then he got the call to, to start working with, with the Beatles when Norman Smith uh, became head of Parlophone. Okay, so that was fairly established. Now, one of the things you have to realize is that the old timers hated working with the Beatles. Really? They, they couldn't stand it. And the, one of the main reasons was all of these guys were in their forties at this point mm -hmm. and they had families. And the sessions used to be 10 to one, 2.30 to 5, 37 to 10. That suited them perfectly for their family life, and also it happened to coincide with pub hours very well. That's so. <laughs> uh, but the Beatles weren't sticking to those rules, and they would not come in till five or six o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. and go till six or seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And the old timers hated that. Sure. So that's the reason initially why Jeff, the youngest one there, was put on the sessions yeah, because he, he would. He didn't care. Yeah, no, right. Yeah. And it wasn't he like 19 or something when he started? Uh, with those? He would have. I'm not sure. It, it wasn't... Very young, yeah. Yeah, 20, 1920, something like that. Yeah. So he's he's going. Now, I'm up mastering. I get the phone call one day that we want to promote you to being an engineer. Uh, 
great, thanks, yeah, love it. So I went down there and I spent two weeks sitting next to another engineer, mm -hmm. watching what they do. Uh -huh. I'm not allowed to touch anything. You're a shadow. Yeah. yeah, I just sit there and watch. And then I get my first session ever. Mm -hmm. And it's the bloody Beatles. <laughs> We're going to throw you in the river. Oh, Ken. I, now, there, there is a disagreement between me and Jeff as to what actually happened. He says he was going on vacation. Hmm. Uh, fine, but if he'd had a vacation booked, EMI is not stupid. <laughs> If he's got a vacation <laughs> book, they would have had someone lined up for Beatles sessions yeah. way early. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't have put someone, their first session ever. Right. I'd never pushed up a fader. I'd never turned a knob on a compressor. Or a and you're doing the before. Beatles. Yes. No problem. So I, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I just find it hard to believe that it was going on vacation as opposed to walking out. As, it, as he openly admits, he did later. Yeah, but that, that's just a disagreement between us. Night, who knows? Yeah, because in his book, I think he talked about how he was. I'll be delicate about it. They were, they just weren't seeing eye to eye on things. Well, that was the White Album later. Oh, okay. So that, yeah. Oh, okay. With magical, magical mystery to it. No, it was just he was going on holiday. Oh, right. Okay, fair but, enough. Uh, so I, yeah, I sat down there. First session ever. It was doing a revisit on Your Mother Should Know. They'd recorded it initially at an outside studio and Paul just wanted to try a different arrangement and uh, I had to try it. Luckily the arrangement didn't work out so I wasn't quite so much uh, on the <laughs> line there but uh, no. That, and then, what is it, three days later my first orchestral session ever and it was I'm Laura's. Wow. Wow. So yeah. it's all downhill from there. Absolutely. Huh? <laughs> well, that, that's the funny thing. I tell the story. People ask about my first meetings with, with Bowie. And I did his, uh, I did two albums before I started to work with him as co-producer. That was uh, the Space Oddity album and Man Who Sold the World. Two was, of my favorites, yes. Okay. Thank you. People, people say, so what, what did you think of him then? Did, did you, and moving into production, did you know he was going to be a huge star? And no, he was a nice enough guy. Just a nice he, guy who he came out. Obviously, had a certain amount of talent, mm -hmm. but a superstar never. Now you've got to put that into the sort of the time area for me. I I just finished working with the Beatles. I yes. was working with George Harrison. Right. I, Relatively speaking, I, yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> nothing. Yeah, just an okay talent. Well, I was going to kind of go down that path with something you mentioned earlier because I know, like, when I go hang out at studios here, when I get the unbelievable good luck to hang out at Henson or at Capitol or you know, East West or something. After a couple of days, I immediately get into, oh, hey, there's a guy who's one of the most famous people on the planet. Oh, and there's a girl who has 12 Grammys. And you kind of get, I wouldn't say blasé about it, but you, you, the adrenaline doesn't happen anymore. And I was, you know, I would imagine when you're in that kind of environment, like you're saying, coming down from working on the Beatles, that when you're interacting with these people, it might have just felt like a normal day at work sometimes. Absolutely. Well, even working with the Beatles became a normal day. Yeah. That's the thing. It, it, it's, you become a little anesthetized to it yeah. all. But I, I guess I've been lucky in as, in as much as I've never lost that whole thing of when there's a great performance, yeah. it, it's, that's... That's what I live for. Yeah, it has to be it's, just in, moving and unforgettable. Yeah, I, I hate to <clears throat> jump around. I know. No, please, that's fine. Yeah, I, I did a project, uh, a very personal project called Epic Drums, mm -hmm. and in that's a, a drum software program with samples with with uh, four bar grooves that people can put together. All of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I did it with five drummers that uh, I'd worked with in the past very successfully. There was. Uh, Woody Woman Z from Bowie's Band, Spiders. Mm -hmm. There was Bob Seidenberg from uh, Super Tramp. There was Billy Cobham from Mark Vishnu Orchestra. There was Terry Bozio from Missing <laughs> Persons. And there was Rod Morgenstein from Dixie Dregs. Just a bunch of hacks. Yeah, yeah I know. A bunch of so, hacks, yeah. So I'm, I spend an awful long time... All fantastic freaking drummers, oh. for those of you that don't know. You're okay. talking cream of the crop. Drummers, drummers. I was taking their performances and cutting them into two and four bar <laughs> groups. Mm -hmm. and this was going on and on and on. And there would be times when it was, oh my God, why yeah. the hell did I get into this? Why did I ever start? I must yeah. be mad. And was getting more and more depressed at it. <laughs> then suddenly there'd be one of those Tom Fills that, yeah. oh my God, there that's it is. amazing. Yeah. That's why I got into it. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. And it's, there's still that for me. Just, it's, now I, that's what I live for. 
Fantastic. Very good stuff. So, um, you know, I want to ask you some technical questions, too, because both on Mystery Tour and the White Album, there's some very uncharacteristic sounds on there that you don't consider to be Beatles sounds. Um, I think, you know, it shows your hand in it, which I think they're great sounds, but okay. it was sort of away from the everything close mic, Vox amp, sort of ultra mid rangey guitar sounds. And your guitar sounds on there, to me, sound much more broad and hi-fi and maybe some different microphone choices. And you know, I'm a guitar player, so it's these are the things that I pay attention to. I mean, Jeff seemed to get a very focused, in-your-face, mid-rangey kind of guitar sound, which is fantastic. But um, there's a lot of tracks that you're like, wow, this is no, you, this you, is an evolution. Was it a change of gear, or was it just no, you 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 doing I, it how you liked it? Or it, a certain amount comes from them always. It, for yeah. me, it always starts in the studio. Every good recording starts in the studio from right. the performance, the material, and the sound in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were changing things. A lot of the stuff, when you first start engineering, you follow the person in front of you. You use exactly the same mics mm -hmm. in the same positions. So I don't know quite what the changes were. There, there was a point, because of the Beatles being the way they were, uh, they, they, for a number of tracks, would just come in when it came time to mix and say, okay, we want full bass and full treble on every track. What? <laughs> you want full bass and full treble on every track, so that's what you have to do. You just have to turn it up. Sure. And that's how you mixed it. Right. So it, <clears throat> a lot of it comes from them. From and, the artists, and, yeah. But it's, it's also that the whole thing is you learn from that as, as you're doing it. Hopefully you learn from it. And it's, well, you know, actually well, that, it doesn't matter what you do as long as it sounds right. That's right. And, and yeah. that, that's one of the things. Today it's become so bloody technical. I did a, a class for uh, USC. Uh, a couple of months ago to do with drum recording drums mm -hmm. and we did it at the village here in in Hollywood yeah yeah and the 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 teacher was there early as I was because I try and I want to try and teach the same thing as as the, the teacher <laughs> and I said to him okay what's the one thing with recording drums that you always try and put across to the students he said well the most important thing is always phase You've got to make sure everything's in phase. Mm -hmm. I just looked at him and said, "Oh, sorry." How do you do that? <laughs> no, I, I, I said that's something that's never bothered me. If it sounds good, it doesn't matter if it's in or out that's of phase. That's true. Yeah. It, it's you go for what it sounds like. Yeah. There, there is no right or wrong to doing that. It, it's if it sounds good, it's right. It is good. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Well, I'm very glad to hear you say that because. Uh, there's a lot of imperfections in recordings that become the characteristic sound. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think of bands like Queen, you know, the guitar's out of phase all the time. And the, the mics that they're using on it are far away and they're out of phase. Yeah. And it sounds fantastic. Yeah. It's not a problem. I just want to interject because Ken told me something about, was it a Jeff Beck recording made at Studio 2 or something, Abbey Road, where they had a great room sound? And oh. I remember because it, it, it illustrates getting yeah. a good sound that you think is great and then as the record yeah. evolves the sound may not be exactly what you wanted yeah and i think that's a good perspective because nobody's perfect out of the box yeah. nobody nails it always the first time but it's a great adaptation of something a great what, sound. Yeah, what, what happened i was working on a jeff beck album there and back mm -hmm. and we were working in number two at abbey road and simon phillips another incredible drama yeah, was, yeah. was playing and for whatever the track was we were laying down drums first there may have been a keyboard or something in the control room we were taking DI just to play along with him. But I set him up in, in number two and I had a couple of distant mics at the far other end of the studio. And it was the biggest, most amazing drum sound I'd ever heard. Yeah. It was incredible. Then we put the bass on and I had to pull the distant mics back a bit. Mm. Then we started to put keyboards on and the only way you could hear the keyboards was if I took the distant mics back oh, a little gosh. further. Yeah. Then, of course, it was Jeff's time, and he's the star, so he's got to come out more than anything. So we had to. Mm -hmm. By the time it finished, it was just it was the same drum sound as it was, I had tried. <laughs> just a regular but, drum yes. sound, yeah. But it, it's it's that thing. Quite often, less is more. I, I, Rod Morgenstein, the drummer of the the Dregs, he tells of uh, our first meeting. We were doing uh, pre-production on the What If album at, down at SIR and I sit down there listen to the first song about halfway through uh, hold, stop, stop, stop 
And I go over and I lambaste him, apparently. Well, he took it that way <laughs> because he was overplaying. He, every sing, every yeah. film was just, yeah. complete all over the kit. Now, it, it's, it's <clears> this <throat> young guy that they're playing jazz fusion. They think, mm -hmm. oh, we've got to show our chops the entire time. And I, I cut him down to such a simple part. Yeah, yeah. And he hated me. <laughs> he thought I was the devil incarnate at that oh. point. And then he started to see how it worked in the studio. And you could hear everything, but he was still he was still there. It wasn't all getting messy. Yeah. And it, he says it completely changed how we could, how we thought of things. He learned, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He said it made his career because from then he then went on to there's a there's a rock band he plays with uh, Winger. He played, yeah. And he said I would never have got that gig if that's I true. Played the way I used to. And, yeah. But it, it's that less is quite often more. That's right. And with drumming too, it's you know. Well, I, I like less because they can hit harder. <laughs> yeah, they you can. Get more tone they that can, way for they me. can. That's true, but it's sort of like you know, if your muscles are already flexed, then how much more power do you have? Yeah. So if everything's just crazy all the time, then what if we want to highlight you for yeah. four bars? Well, how do we do that? Well, that for me is one of the problems these days. All of the drummers, so many of the drummers, I can't say all, but they're used to the the live situation and always playing rim shots mm -hmm. because it's louder. Right. They have to cut. But it's not necessarily the best sound. It's not more it musical, also, yeah. I much prefer it if they aim for the center, just hit that all the time, and then when they want to come up a bit more, then you hit the rim shot. Yeah, then crack it. Very interesting. Well, it's. I imagine we could just go on for unbelievable hours and maybe get you to spill some dirt on who was difficult to work with and who was not. You know the hardest one? One of the hardest things? Mm-hmm was interesting it was with Jeff Beck and it was on there and back mm -hmm. and the reason it was hard is not what one would normally expect it, it's he didn't feel good enough to be playing with the musicians he was playing with oh you're kidding I literally had to pull performances out from him had to give him a pep talk uh, yeah it, it, that that was hard Jeff was is really insecure hard. I can't well, imagine he's, that. I've gone through believe me I've gone through because I did the first album with him the uh, truth mm. and there I just want to so hug you when you say these names. I just, I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Like you mentioned these things, and I just want to go. Oh, Ken, you know. he, he was a regular guy for that. Then that came out. They toured the states. They came back. We had one session for the next album, mm -hmm. and it was egos like you would not believe. Ah. It was, in, and it was obviously wasn't going to work. So no. <laughs> sessions were cancelled. They moved on. Then I got to start working with him again when I was working with Stanley Clark because he'd come in and guest on one track mm -hmm. of their album. And he was back to being a sweetheart again. Really yeah. nice guy. Got guy. back down to earth. Then it was there and back, and he'd gone the complete opposite. The lack of ego, yeah. anti-ego almost. Yeah, yeah. It didn't feel good enough. So I've oh. sort of gone full circle with him. <laughs> Jeff, I've been with you through thick and thin, <laughs> brother. <laughs> right. Trust me, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's mentioned a question, which is uh, just a few years or later, or around that period. It's, uh, it says, John McLaughlin and Birds of Fire, which is a Mahavishnu orchestra record. Yeah. Ken worked on I said, please mention amps and relative loudness. <laughs> Marshall 100 watt full bore, from what I remember. Yeah. It, it's, it was loud. I went through a, a situation. We started Birds of Fire at Trident in London. And we got a lot done, but we didn't complete it. So we were going to finish it over in the States. Now, this was going to be my first time ever in the States. Ah. The big dream back then for all the Brits was going to the States. Yeah, yeah. So I, um, we were going to do it down in, in Miami. We were going into Criteria. And because coming to the States, first time, quite possibly the only time I'd ever come to the States. And you get to see Florida. I brought, the, brought yeah. the family with me and all of that. So we go into Criteria, trying to get it all together. I've got the mics on, on Cobham's kit and mic up uh, John's amp. And John starts to play. And it, it, sound, it almost sounded like a pig nose, if you remember those. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was so quiet, and just, so he goes over, he turns it up a bit more, and it, it, we could never do it. And finally, he turns it, it he literally does turn it full bore, and it, the amp just blows. <laughs> okay, there was something wrong with the amp. Yeah. So they're bringing in another amp, and whilst they're doing that, I'm working on, on Cobham's kit. I listen to the uh, bass drums, and they sounded too dead. So I go out, hey, Billy, can you take the damping out of the drums? He said, There isn't any. Mm -hmm. What the hell is going on? I walk out there, and just at that point, John's got the next 100 watt Marshall set up, 
and he tries it again and it's still the same it's like a pig nose and it was at that point that it dawned on us what was going on criteria was set up that the 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 big in the big american sound at that point was was disco Mm -hmm. which was all very very dead very close right and criteria it it was almost it wasn't quite an anechoic chamber, but it was heading in that direction. Yeah. It was so dead. It was taking sound away. Yeah, absolutely. You so had no was, gain in the room at yeah. all. It was, yeah. a, it was obvious it was completely the wrong place for that mm. type of band. You That's not a rock and roll room, you know? yeah. So we had to walk out, and I got oh, I got a lot of criticism for that from the manager. I'm sure the record company loved that. Yeah. Mm. Let me see. I'm going to get. I'm going to move your mic just a hair oh. closer, um, just because I'm so professional. And uh, oh, good, now I can lean back. Yeah, yeah, you can lean back. I just want to make sure I, I'm still listening to it here. Um, let's see now. There, there's a gentleman on here named Tony Conley who um, is a writer on the internet also and does a lot of uh, high, high publicity uh, internet things. Um, he says, Is there any chance that Ken remembers what kind of amps Clapton and Harrison used on All Things Must Pass? One of the best clean lean lead tones ever. I know that's was, quite a small detail. Yeah, I know. I, I wasn't interested in any of that back then, so yeah. no, I, I can't tell you. Plus, it was it was constantly changing. Uh, sometimes it, it would probably be Vox. More often than not, it would be Fender, mm-hmm. I think, by then. Uh, so I think in that period, wasn't Clapton kind of a Strat through a Fender guy? I, th- I seem to remember that. I, it's funny, because my business partner in this company is a guy named Peter Stroud, who is Sheryl Crow's musical director. Cheryl has the same manager as Clapton, um, Scooter Weintraub, yeah. I don't know if you've ever met him. Yeah. <clears throat> and when Clapton was doing the Cream reunion thing at the Royal Albert a few right. years ago, apparently the, the word we got from behind the scenes was there was a lot of disagreement with him and the rest of the band because he was going to play a Strat through Fender Amps. And it came down to the fact where he, he sort of confessed that the only reason he didn't do that before was because he felt so intimidated by Hendrix. And he said, if I played a Strat, people would compare me to Hendrix, mm-hmm. and I'd always fail that test. And if you look at his career, almost to the day after Hendrix passed away, he and switched he over to Strats through Fender Amps. Because he, he never felt... Isn't that funny? Yeah. You look at those guys like, Eric, what on earth I, do you I, have I, to be insecure about? And maybe yeah. that's what drives some fantastic artists, yeah. is that insecurity. But, of course, uh, always. Yeah. Always. It's all, you always have to prove something. Yeah. Uh, and... I, I'm the same. It, 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 I think. Well, that's the way I am. To, with you have to strive for, for something more. Yeah. I, I thought I had achieved uh, my my perfection with Crime of the Century. Yeah. And the next two albums after that, it was really, really hard because yeah. I had nothing to strive for. Sure. But then I started to my ideas of sound changed. I'd listen to. Crime of Century one day is, oh, why did I get that snare sound? It should have been a bit live or yeah, You and grew, suddenly, you evolved. Suddenly yeah. I start, well, I changed. Yeah. And that, I started to find fault. And from then on, there's, I realized there's always something to, to strive for. And you yeah. Have to. Oh, I'm what, the what, same what, way. What? I confess with my gear, sure. a lot of it's driven by the fact that I want to do these things better Absolutely. than anybody. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, what, one other quick thing. I, I have to say, we, uh, back to the what Eric and George used. I did not record Eric at all for All Things Was Pass. Uh, a great engineer, Phil McDonald, started off All Things Was Pass at EMI. And then George came to me at Trident after they'd got all the basic tracks done. And I worked with him on the overdubs, uh, vocals, guitars, orchestral, and the mixes. So I, it, although I did a lot of electric guitar with George, I, I didn't do any with Eric at that point. So. Yeah. Was recording Wawa as hypnotic as it is to listen to? <laughs> I don't, I don't, hypnotic, I don't know. Yeah, that song just puts me in a trance every time. It? Yeah, I don't know what it, even when I hear other people playing. There's a with, guy with boredom or because no, I don't know what it is. I go all zen and like yes, the rhythm and the guitar and the beat. Layered and, vocals. And... Yeah, because there, there's a there's a guy here in town. I'm sure you know him, uh, Mike Campbell, that plays with oh, yeah. Tom Petty. He's yeah. got his own band called the Dirty Knobs, which only English people know what that means. Of course. And uh, uh, there was a, uh, a Van Halen album, Standing Hampton, I think it was. It was yeah, right. Like which, yeah, of course, we know exactly what that is. Yeah, now, exactly. Yeah. And you know, yeah, I live in London enough to where it's hard for me not to say Robert is your father's brother, um, <laughs> which uh, you you know that. 
There's many uh, Come on. expressions that never get around here, which is why you can use them. Because <laughs> America, yeah, right, right, well, right. but every American knows Bob's your uncle, but they never get it when you say Robert's your father's brother. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so the Dirty Knobs do an incredible version of Wawa, and the same thing. I listen to it and just kind of zen out. It's really good. Well, the, the, what amazed me, which I think he was he was a part of, was the uh, concert for George, mm-hmm. which I know Brian was there as well. Right? Oh, you were actually there. Yeah. yeah. Oh my there. gosh. Yeah. It's a fantastic was, show. Oh, it, it was unbelievable. Well, you know, if you're comfortable with it, I mean, there's some sort of personal questions. I, I'm dying to ask you about that. Like, what sort of impact does a soul like George Harrison make on you? Like, what sort of lingering residue is there from having... I'm sure there has to have been hundreds of moments when he said something or did something and his apparent kindness and love and generosity caught you for a moment. And you walked away going, I know how to be a different person now or a better person now. Yeah. I don't know that you specifically... It, it just wears off on you. I don't yeah. know that you can specifically say... Little I'm, I'm going to be a different... Yeah. yeah. I'm going to be a different... But he was... He, I've always said that anyone that went through what the Beatles went through mm-hmm. uh, would come out totally different the other end. And he was the one that came out the most human. Really? To me, yeah. The most it, normal. Because when you read about the Beatles stuff, you know, it's, of course, it's a story when you're reading it. But it, it, it seems like 75% of it was traumatic. Yeah, between the girls and the lack of a private life and Absolutely. the amount that they were working, you know, that's the thing that doesn't come across in a lot of storytelling about those guys is that they it's worked non-stop. their ass yeah. off. I mean, they were working constantly. I think that the, their one sort of breathing time was in the studio. Mm-hmm. Be, that's that's the way it became, mm-hmm. and that's where they were the most comfortable. I think that's why they stopped the touring thing. There's a bit of reformatting thinking. You said the stories we hear about the Beatles are the story we know, and it's someone's perspective. Mm -hmm. Ken has a very unique perspective on the White Album, too, as opposed to what many people have thought about it. That's right. I read a snippet last night. I tried to do a little homework on you, and I I understand that one of the themes in your book, which I'm covering up with my drinks, is that the White Album was not a big, miserable, antagonistic environment that most people think it was. No, absolutely not. Uh, It's... Just sort of an apocryphal I, I, tale. I, I, I think that there may be reasons for that, but uh, I have worked on projects, a lot of projects that would take two weeks, mm-hmm. and at some point during that, someone's artistic temperament would show, and they'd be raised voices for a brief period, for a minute, yeah. and then it, that's artists. It happens. Uh, mm-hmm. My God, I've known it happen with me before now, even. I so think that it, happens with humans. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Uh, with artists a little more frequently. But, uh, <laughs> a little more human than most. <laughs> oh, that's one way of looking at it. Yes. Uh, diplomatic, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, so w- when you're spending six months on a project, as the White Album was, it's going to happen more than once. And yeah. So, yeah, of course, they f- would flare up every now and again. But overall, my time with them working on the album, it was fun. Mm-hmm. And to double-check my memories, because I know how bad memory is, yeah. especially of 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, uh, I spoke with Chris Thomas, who was George, uh, George Martin's assistant at that point, mm-hmm. who was at a lot of the sessions. I spoke with John Smith, who was my second engineer, and we all, we all agree, it was, a, it was great fun. There were moments of tension. Sure. Now, one of, the, one of the things that I've been doing a lot of interviews lately because of the book, and sort of thinking back after these, some of these interviews on what it was like, um, um, why maybe it was stated that it was so bad by Jeff. Yeah. Uh, very much in his book I, I wonder if it was that whole thing of they had they had done Pepper which was right up Jeff Street it was mm-hmm. it was so sort of perfect and pop and all that but they wanted to move in a more of a rock and roll direction yeah and maybe maybe there was just some something going they were rubbing because Jeff yeah, Jeff was used to them the other way. They wanted more sort of rock and roll, yeah. which suited me perfectly because that that's more my yeah. my style kind of thing. So Bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> that, that, maybe that's what it was. It, it, there was just that rubbing because they wanted to change. And uh, I, there's also a personal perspective. I remember interviewing Norman Smith, uh, who was the first Beatles engineer for about the first half of their career. Let's do that. that one works too. Good. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I'm and, wearing a mic short. Here, that's guys. all right. Sorry. And Norman Smith just said, uh, you know, when they first came in and they were the young, fresh Beatles, they were so eager and they tried so hard and they were really fresh and, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, absorbing things. And by 1964, 65, they were getting to be trouble to deal with because they had their own ideas and they weren't getting along anymore. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, that's interesting. By 1964, help. Uh, Hard Day's Night he goes yeah they weren't getting along so much anymore they were starting to battle and I was like wow that's early on and then Jeff's story was when they came in they were unified and working together and doing well because that was his experience with them Yeah. although people had been in the room your impression is your impression and so uh, there may have been things back in Hamburg, Germany where they had issues that we don't know about but we see the fresh eager so these are all perspectives just different parts of the story and there is no true picture it's just a perspective well, to take into account that yeah. so many people say, you know, I can hear them breaking up during the Let It Be and say, no, you've seen a short piece in the film where they have a discussion. Yeah. But there's a lot of dancing. There's a lot of fun. If you see the outtakes, they're having a great time, too. Yeah. So, yes, they did argue. Most people do. but And it certainly did lead towards the end of things all the way through. It was evolving to a new thing. But there's certainly great moments of fun, great moments of people working together at any given period in that whole career yeah. well you know even that's great you mentioned that the, the Abbey Road or the Let It Be movie because there's so much focus on the discord in there but 90% of that movie is them playing music where they're smiling and you right. can tell that they love each other yeah. Yeah. Well, not that they're friends right they love each other it, it was a marriage yeah. it yeah. was a four way marriage and that's why when it split it was so devastating so they were sort of Mormon before it was cool <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Come on, yeah. I couldn't resist. I mean, uh, a same-sex four-way yeah, right. marriage. I mean, that's just how politically correct can you get? That's <laughs> just a conservative nightmare, isn't it? And they smoked pot too, you know. But no, you can tell. Uh, in all seriousness, that's a rude joke. I apologize, but I can't resist. Um, but you can tell in that movie that you know they're having a blast. Well, there, there, there are things. There's uh, a video on of. Paul recording Blackbird mm-hmm. uh, that's on YouTube and there's this conversation that goes on he, he the tape breaks down or something like that and John comes on the talk back to him and the fun that they're having the mm-hmm. interaction between the two of them John putting on an American accent yeah. and discussing it's it's funny it, yeah. it's a lot of fun that was uh, they were not getting along at that point it certainly doesn't sound like it to me and yeah. I, they then got involved a short time after that and it seemed fine. Yeah, well, you know, in any situation, there's always a certain amount of people that want to sort of knock people down a notch. Yeah. And, you know, I've, my limited experience playing music for a living, which was for about a decade, mostly in the 80s, <clears throat> I never cut a demo tape without somebody having an argument. <laughs> Let alone, yeah. let's do an album that's yeah. high pressure and high budget and, you know, all these sorts of things. Yeah. So I, I always kind of take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can we venture down a path of talking about, since there's so many guitar players and people yeah. like that, John, I mean, Ken's worked with all these amazing people. John McLaughlin, we mentioned, but there's Mick Ronson doing the Bowie stuff. I was going to get Tommy to... Tommy Bolin playing on the... There's a lot of people to talk about. I think it'd be interesting for some of these people to do approaches and what was interesting about those guitar players maybe to you or what was different or shocking. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Mick Ronson because that's where I wanted to sort of get into next because he's got it's such a unique guitar sound. And that, it's so easy to get. And I've never heard anyone go for it. No, it it's because I know he was. The legend is he was playing Parks, Park amps, and Marshall. It was all Marshalls. It was Marshall. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it, see, there you go. Yeah, it was Marshall. His his Paul, but the way he got his his tones always, he'd be going through. I think it was a Crybaby wah wah, mm-hmm. and he would just he would go through the sweep and find, find his find, notch. Yes, and then just leave it. Wow. So it was just well, this this radi- uh-huh. radical EQ, but it was it was done via the the, the wah and that's it. Forest for the trees, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so it's, simple. It's, yeah, it sits in the track with a very fixed thing because a wah is a filter that takes out the high and low end. Yeah, but then your amp distorts that to get some fizz on the top yeah. and things, but it gets a very mid range signal. So you get this nice fixed sound that you can mix around, put the bass below it, cymbals above it, things yeah. like that. Oh, I wasn't into cymbals back then. Oh yeah. Oh no, <laughs> that was that was why. I think, in, in retrospect, I did, I, it wasn't anything planned at the time. But on all of the tracks on, on Ziggy, uh, even though it's a rock and roll album, there's an acoustic guitar on every track. And one, one of the things with that is it's reverting back to the early days of rock and roll. Presley always had acoustic guitar. Mm-hmm. Bill Haley always played 
acoustic guitar. So right, 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 right back to the roots. Yeah. yeah, but the other thing is, I tended to use it. I would make it very thin and toppy, and use it instead of the hi hat. I didn't like cymbals at that point, so mm -hmm. I tend to keep them them down. And you use the rhythm that David was playing on on acoustic guitar as like the hi hat. Wow. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So Looking fun. Can on. I come work with you and be an intern or an apprentice or something? Like that? Just for a day, I want to. Sure, get, get me some work and you can do it. Oh, I can help you with that, yeah. Ms. Warren. Warren Cucurillo? For missing persons. Very different. Uh, completely unique. There, there was a, a solo that we were doing on the Spring Session M Missing Persons album. I'm trying to think, I can't remember which track it is at the moment. He was having trouble playing the solo. It wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And he decided to try, which I found out later was a, was a Zappa trick. Uh, he said, when it comes to the solo, just kill the monitors. Just let me hear the guitar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I sort of looked at him and said, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. He said, just get rid of everything. Just let me play. Okay. So, playing through. As soon as the guitar solo is going to hit, I cut everything except the guitar. He plays a solo fine we listened back to it and it was perfect <laughs> so he just got to go al fresco for yeah, a minute absolutely and, and he was okay it perfectly but th there are so many things like that also on spring session m with with patrick o'hearn the bass player another ex zappa guy uh there was a track called us drag which we were going for for the bass and with persons being in the 80s it was more synth oriented mm -hmm. than, than other stuff I've done you know and, and just for those of you guys that might not remember Missing Persons at the time was a really progressive different mm -hmm. sound that was going on there they were really kind of coming out of a pleasant part of left field well it, it was it was bizarre because it, it was very much the new wave sound but coming from uh but you had Zappa people you know that there's going to be musicality there that most of the new wave Artists had no idea. But you had, you know, Terry Bazio, who's yeah. astonishing drummer, and then you had Dale Bazio, who was like the sexy version of Wendy o. Williams. Yeah. You know, with her black duct tape outfits. And, yeah. you know, it was just, I remember being a young guy at the time going, wow, she's astonishingly sexy, but I'm actually more interested in the I, music. Is that weird? Yes. Because that, that didn't happen. Usually you had these crazy looking bands, you're like, wait, they're entertaining, they're, yes. they're jesters, and it's fun. I enjoy that. I think that that was what turned me on the most about Persons was that the they were ultra commercial. They mm -hmm. had the the sex with with uh, Dale there, but also the musicality of them with with all fantastic. ex ex uh, Zappa people. Yeah. It was just amazing. Yeah. They could have gone so far. But I was, I was saying about this bass track with I'm uh, sorry, I can't worry. There, yeah, with 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 Patrick, just the way things work. We so we started off on this track. We put down a, a Moog bass. Mm. Yeah, it was good, but, you know, it just wasn't it. Okay, let's try bass guitar. So, of course, Patrick being Patrick, it wasn't just a regular bass guitar. He had to pl uh, play fretless. Mm. Okay, he, he got it. It sounded really good. It just wasn't quite there. So some bright spark, and I have no idea who it was, said, well, let's listen to both basses together. <laughs> oh, you've got to be joking. A fretless, it's bad enough playing a, be, a, a fretted bass yeah, with a synth It's going to be dissonant. Yes, yeah. but a fretless, forget it. We played them together, and it worked absolutely it perfectly. Brilliant. Wow. And that's what's on there. It's it, That goes to show how amazing Patrick is as, as a bass player. Fretless. Incredible, and he could he could nail it. Yeah, either that or he had a giant vibrato. <laughs> I guess, maybe. But I'm actually very fond of Warren Kirkwell's odd guitar sounds on those records. They're very unusual and distinctive. Mm-hmm. Although they're still rock guitar, he was getting a different sound. Yeah, I, I've no idea. I, I know we used to. He had this strange guitar that was given to him by by Frank. That it was made out of. If I remember correctly, it was made out of a wah wah pedal. And it was just this very strange sort of very small body. I, he he'd play that. Uh, I honestly can't remember the amps we used or anything. But I didn't he remember. get into more regular vintage guitars later? Oh, on? when we were doing Duran, uh, yeah. Because he he, with the success of Duran, he bought more guitars, and they were all new. And I, uh, uh, when when my Grinch comes out, uh, one one of the things <laughs> that I always bitch about are modern guitars. I I. Mm. 
this whole thing of uh, high output pickups and all of that kind of thing uh, to get rid of any kind of noise you don't want mm -hmm. uh, it, to me it makes them all start sounding the same there's, it, there's not the, the right. you could, you'd had the Strat sound which was amazing then mm -hmm. you had the Paul sound yeah. and all the, these days all, for me a lot of those guitar a lot of the guitars sound identical they all sound like this yeah and there's that was well, there's that high end yeah. edge to them as well that right. you can never get rid of but so Warren was getting a certain amount of that with his, his guitars and I just said to him one day on this Duran album that you know what just an old Les Paul sound would sound perfect on this mm -hmm. And of course, Warren being Warren, he comes in next day with this amazing old Les Paul. 59. And it works perfectly. Yeah. And, oh, this is great. So then he immediately started to collect all of these old <laughs> guitars. Well, it is kind of funny. You know, we uh, I know that's not really why you're here, but, you know, with my business, I have this, and on the show a lot when I'm playing my amps, you know, a lot of people comment on that very thing. I'm like, I use low output pickups that aren't potted. And... Yeah, they might squeal a little bit on stage, yeah. or they might hum. Yeah, and uh, but it didn't bother Jimi Hendrix, no, and it right. didn't bother Jeff Beck, right. and it didn't bother Jimmy Page. Well, they, 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 in one of my, in my talks, at times I I play this this one bit. I uh, a couple of guitar tracks off of uh, Rock and Roll Suicide, I think it is off of off of Ziggy, mm -hmm. and you hear that I I didn't sort of mute anything before or after. So on the, the first guitar, there is so much hiss and yeah. everything coming in. Then he starts to play, and, it, and then this other one, there's a huge hum, and he plays. Then I play the mix. Mm -hmm. It gives you, it texture. You hear nothing. You don't hear that at all. There's no. so much else going on. You hear the guitar tone, which oh, is yeah. amazing, as opposed to the noise. It, it's The only time that is of any importance is if it's just a solo guitar. And nothing else going on to hide that. That's mix. right. Then it becomes a little more. If you're alone in your basement yeah. and you're playing yeah. guitar, it can be annoying. But, but that, that's the that's one of the problems these days. It's too many people are doing that as opposed to getting out and playing live. There, there's a lot of that. I think there, there's a lot of the misshapen logic of you can do both. Uh, you know, you can have a strat that sounds like a beautiful old strat and a nice piece of wood, and it's not going to hum. And it's going to stay in tune perfectly. Yeah. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. Those things don't happen. Same with our amps. You know, like, I don't filter the AC very hard because I like the amp to breathe. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of comments from people going, well, I get a little bit of AC noise. And I, like, have you ever heard a real AC-30? Have you ever heard a real 100-watt right. Marshall? They make all kinds of noise. Oh, yeah. But who gives a shit? Once yeah. you hit the first chord, you're never going to hear it. The worst thing that can happen is it gives your recording texture. Yeah. You know, I, I have a lot of those Pro Tools breakdowns of, of you know, tracks. Oh, yeah. One of the ones I, I kind of brought up earlier I've been listening to is uh, Day at the Races and Night at the, Night at the Opera. And you've got a room full of AC-30s that are, that are distant mic. And when you listen to the, just those tracks, because Brian May didn't even bother to roll his guitar back when he wasn't playing. It's just sitting there going... Ah! <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and you—I've never noticed it in my life until right. I heard. And he's playing it as his homemade single coil pickups. Right, we're noisy as hell. Yep. there's no RF shielding whatsoever on those amps, and there's no RF shielding on those pickups because they didn't care. No, and because they wanted the amp and they wanted the guitar to breathe. Well, you want the tone uh, for the music. Yeah, and everything else around it. Yeah, yeah, you I don't mean, care about it. I, you. The main important thing is the sound of the guitar yeah. playing, the notes. That's, That's right. what needs to sound right. And I always joke that these people wouldn't want Marilyn Monroe to have the mole. You know, it's like, it's not Marilyn Monroe without the mole. Yeah. You know, you yeah. got to have these things for it to be human. Yeah. And it doesn't bother me at all, but uh, there's been a lot of very good, successful, aggressive marketing about making recordings perfect and Absolutely. guitars perfect and drums perfect and... So what? So what? If your cymbals overshoot the mics a little bit, it gives it humanness. You, you yeah. can tell. You can tell he's laying into it. You know. One one of the things for me with Bowie, one of the reasons why we're still talking about them forty years on, uh, is Bowie's vocals were one take. Really? It, it was. Um, wow. Of the four albums I co-produced, ninety-five percent of the vocals were one take. I'd get the level. I'd go back. 
we'd start recording and we'd go through and that would be it that, that would be, be it. the master there's no auto tune no. no moving around to put it in time yeah he sang every chorus uh and it's a performance he sang his heart heart out every time mm -hmm. and unlike today where it's all totally processed and I th I, yeah it, it look his vocals aren't perfect there are places where it's not quite in tune it's slightly out of time but it's human it's human and it, it is a performance and it's art yes yeah if you want perfection take a photograph if you want art let's see a painting oh I think oh yeah, yeah art can also be a, pho a photograph yeah that may, may be a poor it's, analogy but you know what I mean yeah. it, it's uh, there's a difference between documenting something and presenting it as art now that would be an interesting challenge. You know, like though. a like a videotape versus a film. You know, it's uh, you see the warts and all with all this stuff, and it, it's it's nice. Yeah, yeah, interesting challenge because we live in a world of being able to fix things and being able to record them again, even on a multi-track tape or Pro Tools or whatever you've got, is to tell yourself whatever I record for this first take is going on the record. Mm -hmm. Would make you practice differently. Would make you think differently. Sure. And possibly perform with a new excitement, like a live show. Absolutely. Uh, because we think walk in thinking. Well, I'll do a few warm-up takes first, and then I'll comp together the three good ones after that. Yeah. And you, you have a different approach to the, your performance, so I think it's really a good possibility for people to excite themselves by taking away the safety net. Yeah, th th there's that, but I have no problems with... I, I will record seven or eight vocal tracks and then comp one. Yeah. But at least it's at, it is all part of a performance, and it is the vocalist actually singing it. That's it's right. not singing it and then sitting at a computer and changing it, putting it in tune, out of tune, but all of all of that kind of thing. Even it, by today's standards, though, seven or eight takes is pretty Spartan. Yeah. You know, I, I, I work with a lot of producers here in town, and, you know, I get the luxury of being a fly on the wall because when I'm bringing gear around, and I'll sit there and watch them do 20, 30 takes. Yeah. And go, look, I want the ah and the T from that one. Oh, I've done that. And yeah. I take the breath, you know, but, but they're, t you know, having this poor girl sit there in front of a microphone and sing her heart out for an hour the exact same verse yeah and then they'll, they'll get one good sentence out of it yeah look I, I believe me I've I've done that yeah but it, where where I start to really find fault with it is when it's done electronically well when they don't do it right to begin with. yeah and then okay well you couldn't really hit those notes so yeah. we're going to fix it for right. you well okay what is that then? yeah and, yeah and then of course <clears throat> you don't sing live you yeah. just lip sync and dance, or sing sing to yourself. Um, there's a question I'd like to ask you because I, you know, when I sat down um, when when they did the 40th anniversary of Pepper over here at the Hollywood Bowl, uh, I was extremely fortunate that Jeff picked our amps for Rick Nielsen to use because um, they were trying to get that sound. And I just read Jeff's book and asked him a bunch of questions. And the the question I shouldn't have asked him because it sent him into a, a 20 minute lecture. You know, how do you feel about Pro Tools in general at a macro level? And he was very, very clear that he now works with bands that can't play their own music. Well, the, and, he, and he walks, and they walk in, and, and they're not finished or they're not done. And he said he just kicks them out on the street. He says, I'm expensive. Come back when you're ready to play your song. And do you have experiences like that? Not kicking them out, no. I, I, look, I have no problems with Pro Tools. Uh, I, I th My problems are more of humankind mm -hmm. it, it's always all or nothing we, we oh we can no longer use analog we can only use digital mm. it's they both have their good points it's very let's rigid use, very rigid thinking yes yeah. Let, let's use that the way I prefer to work if the budget's there is I will start off recording on tape mm -hmm. and then transfer it over to, to Pro Tools and hopefully get the best of both worlds well, you can, it's easier to manipulate yeah. in Pro yes, Tools if, absolutely if you have to there, and there make are copies things. and cuts yes. and, yeah but uh he was talking about how it sort of it's made a lot of young bands uh, empathetic about their craft. You know, it's the way he but, felt. But he's, yeah. I think a lot of that apathy also comes from, especially in an area like this, LA, there are so few places to play live. It, That's it's, true. I, but if you think of the, of the Beatles and their training, playing through, what is it, I think three shows a night, six days a week, in Hamburg, yeah. that's how that's they learned their trade doing that. Try and get any band these days. Yeah. Number one to do three shows in a night, uh, but to play six nights on the trot, they don't want to know. And there's oh, yeah. so, there's so much of the as uh, sitting in the basement playing. Or we're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna get it all together in our garage. Yeah, it, it, it's 
No, go out there and play in front of a damn audience. That's oh, yeah. the way you learn because oh, yeah. you have to perform or you'll get booed off. You got to fall on your face a little yes, bit. Yes, absolutely. What was the book? I'm blanking on the name now. I just read it, and it was the the premise of the book is what it takes to become an expert in anything, and it was sort of the ten thousand. Oh yeah, yes, I read that. I'm blanking on the no, name. No, I can't remember. But it. they had a whole chapter on the Beatles yes, in there, yes. and they said by the time the Beatles played on Sullivan in '64, which is you know they played within the first month of '64. They had already performed for over 10,000 hours, yes. which was more than most bands will play in their entire career. Successful bands yeah. will perform in their entire career. Yes. So by the time they came up as this you know, sudden overnight sensation, they had, put, they had paid their dues Absolutely. more than anybody. And so they could sit down and play songs in the studio yeah. live, and it wasn't a big deal for them. Your, your comment with, with regard to Jeff, there, there was a documentary that the BBC did to celebrate the... Uh, 40th anniversary of Pepper, I guess it was. Yeah, it was uh, where, where they 2007. Re- okay, where they remade. They had Jeff and Richard Lush yeah. re-record Sergeant Pepper. With the way tricks, it was. right? No, they did it with all different artists. Oh, okay. They had... Because uh, maybe Trick did one of the tracks. Because they maybe. were working on that at Capitol, I think. I took some gear. No, it was all done in England at... That was uh, a separate thing. That was a different okay. thing. Okay, yeah, sorry. No, yeah. it, it was all done at British Grove in, in England. But uh, one of the... So, did they were you mostly young and upcoming bands. Well, that's the way it finished up. The way it started, <laughs> when the BBC announced, we want to do this, every top band, yeah. I want to do it, I want to do it. Then they found out they had to record it the same way. Mm-hmm. It would be four track. Right. It would be uh, everyone playing at once. Mm-hmm. There'd be no auto-tune. Suddenly, all those hands came <laughs> down. And only a few <laughs> remained. But what, what was interesting, <coughs> they, they, they did do a video of it. Of, of which I found it on YouTube because I don't know how much it was actually shown but there was a great bit with a band called the Kaiser Chiefs Outliers yeah. is the name of the book oh so yes yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so the Kaiser Chiefs they they comment about you know we we actually played live in the studio all of us together and I don't think we'd ever done that before mm. and it it was different it's really good. It's kind of nice. Yes, yeah. and it, it was. It's absolutely fascinating. Mm-hmm. It, they've never done that, and that's what music is. It's a it's a group of people to, and this this whole thing of having one person in one country and another in, in yeah. It just. Try, I, I think I, I get it. I'm just at the right know. age. I'm on that line. You know, I'm 46, and the, a lot of the people younger to, than me seem to not get that. You know, for me playing music, you know, 51, I was in a band, we had a record deal, we didn't get anywhere. You kind of, I was in, I'm in the 99%, right, of the music business. But I had just as much fun playing out here in the shop with my current little pickup band because it's that, it's the human interaction and it's the nonverbal communication and it's yes. the emotion and the feeling and the love or the excitement or the anger or the angst or whatever you want to express to each other. That there's no words for. Right. You can only do that by you know, and you've been in the room when you see a guitar player start to just take off, and you know what's going on in his head, even though there's no words for it. There's no adjective to describe it, and we all go, ah, oh, yeah, right. Here we go. Absolutely. You know, I was uh, seeing an interview with Eckhart Tolle, who's a philosopher, mm-hmm. kind of. He tells people about you know interesting ways to live, and one of the concepts he has is that. To live in the present, to be aware, and to be right in this moment is the highest form of what you can do, and it feels the best. Mm-hmm. You don't get anxious about tomorrow, right. about where the money's coming from, or what you did, or what your parents think of you, or anything like that. He says you really work ahead from, despite your upbringing, where you came from, just to be in the moment and enjoying it. And so the addiction, he to says, let go, yeah. which is really good, which is probably very true, is people who spend their time in the moment, let's say you're cliff jumping or doing something on a trapeze, or you're very much thinking about the present moment. And yeah. it's the most exciting, thrilling feel you can have is to be skiing down a hill because you're not thinking about tomorrow, you hopefully. Can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I find that when he described that, I realized this is what it's like to play guitar mm-hmm. when you're playing with a group or you're playing with other people, especially you have to be doing your part right now. And if you think about the next verse, you're already lost. Yes. It doesn't feel yeah. good. Well, so, uh, it's a wonderful uh, thing to enjoy that moment of I, I can forget yesterday, I can forget yeah. tomorrow. And I, 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 I pine for those things, yes. you know, because yes. you can't do it in any other human interaction. But let's get up to 120 decibels and let the freight train start rolling, mm-hmm. and I can just feel the chains come yeah. off. 
And like yeah. here I am, I'm playing guitar and I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that, that's, that's the high spot. That it's seems those moments. that seems to be gone, you know, for a lot of younger bands. Like they, they, they I talk about or the, the young guys that work here, you know, will play and they're like, God, I've never seen you with that look on your face. I'm like, Mom, yeah, but it will change. I'm just playing rock and roll. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that the music, music is cyclical. Absolutely. The music business is cyclical. Yeah, everything and has it, a season. Yeah, yeah and yeah. It, it, it's, it will come back again. Ta it, it, unfortunately, music and listeners have just been sort of pushed down so much by these conglomerates that, what is it now, four major labels, I think it is? Uh, with, with bankers, with uh, accountants, with attorneys running it. It, yeah. used to, it used to be music people. And well, they've, they've gone. And they... The music people understood what talent is supposed to do. Yes. Talent is supposed to create. That's right. Now they're telling those people what to do. Be creative and so we're at losing 2.30. Everything. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mention it because when I explain to younger guys, like two of the guys that work out here in my shop have bands with deals, you know, like indie label deals. And I tell them that I had this thing that doesn't exist anymore called a development deal. Yep. And, you know, flew the band to New York. We lived there for a summer. They put us in gigs. They made us hang out with people. They made us sit and listen to producers, listen to different artists. You're going to take a lesson from this guy. I want you to go see this band and see what they do. Watch what the bass player does. Blah, 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 blah. And then three months later, we were a better band. You know, and then the rule of thumb then was if you didn't have a hit by your second album, you were sort of walking on thin ice. Now, if your first single isn't a hit... Right the number one download um, within a couple of weeks you're dropped like a hot rock yep it's a different world completely and I'm sure that it, 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 it changes people's motivations yeah you know? talent will win out and I'm, I'm sure that people aren't listening to music the way they used to more because they're being dealt crap than anything mm -hmm. it, it's not it, it's n not really listenable I can't say it's not listenable but it's not the kind you just sit back mm -hmm. and be invoked by it, right. which is the way it used to be. You'd put on an album and you'd sit there and it would take you, it yeah. would be a story. It you'd would take go, you different you'd, places. You'd go on a journey yes. with them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's also true that, you know, you, you think about that concept of like a development deal and what the record industry does. You look at all the bands whose first records weren't hits. Oh, absolutely. Please Please Me was not, oh, right. over here was a complete oh, flop. Yeah. They had to re-release it when yeah. the Beatles came back over. Well, but but um, Bowie had three before... Yeah, his... His in first fact, couple in records. In fact, he had four because Hunky Dory wasn't even big when it came out. It was I know nothing. It but in hindsight, it's fantastic yes. because now we've learned who Bowie is. Yes, we've gotten inside his head a little bit, and you go back and listen and go, "Oh, now I get this." Yeah, you Springsteen know. wouldn't be around. Springsteen's first uh, record was a flop. Yeah, well, yeah I absolutely. think he had a couple, didn't he? Before yeah, there's Aerosmith. I know definitely had a couple of flops before yeah, they made it. That's right. Um, in a response to one question, no, Ken did not record Fog Hat. And the second question, no, you didn't miss anything about Fog Hat. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got a couple of cards here that show up, so you'll friend, get some. You'll get some nice tongue in cheek. Our friend Dusty Wakeman has just weighed in and said hello. Hey, Dusty. Do you know Dusty, uh, engineer, producer guy? I know the name. I uh, worked a lot with Dwight Yoakam. He's sort of the one of the heavyweights in the uh, country rock yeah. thing. You know, that sort of revival in the 80s where yeah. it quit sounding like corporate whiny stuff yeah. and it sounded like a real... As an Englishman, you might not have a deep appreciation for hillbilly rock. But, no, no. But yeah. Ken has gotten into more modern country music from what you told me at some point you were oh, listening one to point, it. Yeah. Well, yeah, to me, that it, it took over from pop. It was, it, it was much better than the way pop music was going. Yeah, on, today's so. country is sort of pop from days gone by. Yeah. Only done with modern know-how. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see. You know, we, we've been going for a little over an hour right now. Might be a good time. But two things I want to make sure we do while you're here. One of which is, are, is there any certain part of your book you'd like to actually dive into? Any stories that you'd like to, do you think no. would would help because yeah, yeah, okay. I so what well, I'm going to do we've been going through it a lot there, there are some of the stories that I've, I've told sort of are, are in there but it's, okay. it's, it's varied There's I just want to make sure because I know this is this is just recently out so what I'm going to do right now is be shameless and put you on the spot so I'm going to read this book over the weekend okay and I'd love if you could at your convenience of course to come back and maybe let me ping you on a few sure. things um and time. you're on camera now, so of course you're being a gentleman. If afterwards you're like, dude, I can't. I don't, I, it's, it's a totally okay. But um, 
even you know, uh, and I, I read you know same thing. I read Jeff's book, and you know, for for someone like me, I know it maybe seems a little bit uh, verging on idolatry or something, but you know, I would get I would go as far to say that there's a bit of a fiduciary duty that you were talking about earlier about handing these things down to people Absolutely. and making sure it doesn't get lost. So I'm asking out of my own selfish reasons because I'm still just my knees won't stop under my desk now because I'm having so much fun listening to this. But there's a lot of people here. I think that you're you're uh, you're giving them a taste of the human side of this that is so missing from any of the stuff. And we all revere and want to be these people. And, and you know, you talk about bands like the Beatles. I think the Beatles are one of the only bands, and there's a few of them you can count on one hand where people didn't want to be in that band they wanted to be that band yeah you know what i mean like yeah. i don't want to play next to john lennon i wanted to be john lennon. yeah you know yeah, i wanted I to be studying. paul mccartney yes. on different days i don't want to be the fifth beetle right. i wanted to be a beetle yeah you know and the fact that you have such a hands-on experience with guys like that and with david bowie and we haven't even touched on elton john right um which i'm personally very curious about because he seems like such a force of nature um, he has his moments. Yeah, <laughs> I know he likes to put on his tiara once in a while, uh, yeah. but but uh, just the virtuosity on the instrument. Well, and, I, I was there when he wrote Rocket Man in ten minutes. Uh, wow! We we were over in in France doing pre production for for the album, and the way it would work, Bernie Taupin, the lyricist, would go up to his room at about eight o'clock every evening come back down for breakfast it was communal living so mm -hmm. we were all sitting around eating and Bernie would put a stack of papers in front of Elton and whilst Elton's eating he's going through yeah I like that one no I don't like that don't like that don't like that yeah like that. sorry I, the phone rings up and I can't show that so. um. <laughs> it's, it's Elton calling <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> You leave me alone. I have a mute button here somewhere, but I can't see anything. Modern technology, yeah. yeah. Old eyes is what it is. I, uh, I can't see anything within arm's reach. Right. What yeah, kind of transformers one. do you have in the phone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to make a new version of the phone. So he, he's going through the lyrics, and he finishes breakfast. He takes them over to the piano. He goes through, and I mean, uh, yeah, puts up his set of lyrics, and he comes up with Rocket Man. Just he flushes out right the, the music part right away. Yeah. Now, when, when Bernie would write out the lyrics, was the melody completely up to... And there was no uh, melody. Oh, yeah, yeah it, was, it was up to... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Up, up to Reginald. And, 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 yeah, Reg, as we used to call him back then, it was yeah. hard to get used to Elton. But, uh, no, he had complete freedom. He could, he could ditch lines, he could ditch uh, verses, which he did with uh, Daniel, the last verse, which yeah. was the one that made it make sense. Ah, okay. he, he left out because it was from an American perspective and he didn't think mm. to quote Bernie uh, a lad from Pinner could actually do it justice or something uh. like that <laughs> how very humble um, <laughs> the guitar player on Elton's records Davy Johnston is amazing I was going to go there because Davy's arguably the most well known sideman in the world and is he? I think so. I mean, when you, you wow. know, there's a, there's a small world of sidemen and there's a pretty narrow family tree and Davey's kind of the guy, you know, Interesting. Like, I've never thought of him that way. You know, he, well, that's he, probably because we live fairly close together and uh, I used to run into him all the time down at Ralph's. Yeah. So, yeah, right. yeah I don't yeah. think of him too much that way. That's right. Well, but I mean, you think of Elton John, you think of Davey Johnson, you think of... But he's not. You yeah, think it's, of it's an Elton uh, John solo person show, but he's always there. He's That's always there. It's mean. sort of like Waddy Wachtel. You know, mm -hmm. when you think of Stevie Nicks, you automatically go Waddy Wachtel, or Linda Ronstadt was Waddy Wachtel. Right. You know that sort of thing. He's one of those guys that, as a guitar player, you know, we all recognize and the yet, side man. And yet, you you speak about Waddy, and you mentioned several a couple of artists. Whereas mm -hmm. Davy is. He's with Elton. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Which uh, I mean, he plays with him on his Vegas show, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he's living with Elton for forty odd years now, right? Uh, on and off. No, well, I mean, was, not literally. Lot, but no, I mean, no. Figure, I was, figuratively, I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, there, there was a for period. Their sake. Yeah, there, there was a period when no, it, it was all other people. He, oh, okay. he wasn't a part of it, and then uh, Elton got back together with with uh, Nigel and with with Davey. And, oh, okay. Uh, 
He's so absolutely a master of the Leslie guitar sound too, though. I think he's really done a beautiful version of that without being overtly like the wah 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 yeah. sound. He does yeah. just beautiful chimey things through a Leslie speaker that yeah, aren't yeah. even noticed sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you know, like you're saying my business partner Peter, who's he's kind of my brother. You know, he's godfather to my children and yeah. best man at my wedding and all these sorts of things. <clears throat> he's in that tree. You know, like you build, they'll start talking about sidemen in that little world, and Peter ends up at about number four, or number five there. And every time I talk to Peter about, it, like, did you ever think you're going to be a sideman? He's no, but yeah, David Johnstone was a guy that made me think, wow, you can do this for a living. Like, you can be a sideman and be fulfilled. You know, somewhat because wow. Peter's not a huge songwriter, but he loves to play music, and yes. he, he actually got yes. to play with Elton doing Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, which is arguably one of Davy's most famous guitar parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, he, we had this big conversation about you know, it was so much fun. I got to be Davy Johnson for a minute. How funny! But it's way it's like you're thinking of it as the band, but Elton John is not really a band. It has come and gone in different periods, yes. and so this is truly. A unit that fits together and we think of them all but it's not the Beatles the Rolling Stones no. or a band it's Elton no. John no matter who he plays with it's an artist with some guys yeah. but, but that guitar player has been integral to those records after the first trio records you know yeah. and so forth yeah. so, you understand I'm a sense. guitar player so that means my IQ is lower than average <laughs> and so my 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 perspective is pretty myopic about guitar you know it's I, I only listen to music where the guitar moves me for the most part and he was one of those guys. Yeah. You know, I was listening to, you know, it wasn't until I probably, be, I was 30 years old that I realized that Elton John was a virtual, you know, uh, player. You know, just unbelievably astonishing yeah. piano player. Oh, yeah. And then I even, even occurred to me that he was playing classical piano. Like there's... Well, funny, funny enough, something I didn't know, uh, Chris Thomas, who was George Martin's assistant mm -hmm. during the White Album time, then went on to produce... Uh, Chicago Climax Blues Band, Sex, uh, Pistols, Sex Pistols, Pretenders, Pretenders mm. Prunkle Harum. Uh, he was at the Royal Academy uh, of Music in London at the same time as, as Elton. They both really? went through together. Wow. I think there was a year difference between them. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic stuff. So, uh, what are you up to these days? I know you live here Pushing in LA. Pushing the bloody book. Pushing the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> can, can, people, can people buy this book on Amazon? Uh, Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, Guitar Center, uh, Sweetwater, and e e uh, I, I books, or I whatever. They yeah, yeah. It. It's, it's out on Apple. One of the electronic versions. Yes. And if you live in Los Angeles... You're doing a talk coming up, right? Yes. And that the was my next question. Is there anywhere we could come and have you sign the book? I mean, I'm going to ask you to sign this one. Sure. But no, I'm, I'm doing one of my presentations at the Grammy Museum on the 19th of July next Thursday. Oh, excellent. And uh, afterwards, I'll be signing books and answering questions. And oh, excellent. Very it's, good. It's, yeah, I was working on that just before I left, actually. Uh, or, well, before the interview that I did before I left. Okay, so I have to ask a really ignorant question, and I might really be, no such thing. as they say, showing my ass right now. It's a technical term. I learned it in mm -hmm. seminary. But um, there's a term thrown around Abbey Road all the time, and I'm wondering, either I'm not remembering correctly, but I'm wondering if it's related to you, and it was Ken's Flanger. No, Ken Townsend. Ken Townsend. Okay, see, I apologize. I knew that was going to happen, but I just no, had Ken, to get Ken it off Ken Townsend my head. at the time uh, was one of the regular maintenance guys at uh, Abbey Road, one of the white coat guys. Mm -hmm. kind of guys. And uh, it all stemmed from John not liking double tracking. Yeah. So he one day was just saying to, to Ken, is there any way we can do it? Without my having to sing it again. Yeah. Yeah. And so Ken worked out this way of but, of coming up with something called, which was called ADT. Now, typically with memories, it's either artificial double tracking or automatic double tracking. Yeah. No one remembers which was the Some official kind of double term, tracking, yeah. yeah. But then one day, the way it was set up, John was messing around with it. And you, you controlled the whole thing through this oscillator mm -hmm. that uh, you could turn the knob on it. And John just started to go mad on the oscillator and it created what he called flanging yeah and that term has remained ever since because the only reason i ask is for selfish reasons because <clears throat> i sing in my band but i'm a guitar player that sings not a singer that plays guitar and i'm always trying to find that sound and i find it by accident once in a while and i know we've talked about it here on the show before 
About, did you continue doing that when you oh. were working with the guys? Oh, yeah. But yeah, to do it properly was such a, a very machine-specific uh, setup. So it was kind of subjective to the gear you were on? Uh, yeah, you, it, because it was all based around uh, Studer four tracks. Uh, so you didn't have any like measurement that you would do to get it? You just kind of no, do it the, by the, ear? It, it all came down to Studer, Studer four tracks at that point were the only machines that had a set of amps for cell sync and a set of amps for, for playback. Oh, okay. So that you, you could bring up, uh, you could have two separate playback, playbacks from the record head, which is the cell sync yeah. head, and the playback, which is slightly later. Yeah. And so what we used to do is we would take whatever the track was that we wanted to ADT or, or flange or phase, we would come out of that cell sync uh, head go to another machine uh, which would then delay it and we could bring it in time with, you with could tweaky tweak yes in there. You, yeah. go, you go from being exactly in phase mm -hmm. to either side of it or more drastically for, for flange did you ever move so, it back and forth well, oh, track? oh talk to Chris Thomas about that yeah uh, he had to do it to get Eric's guitar sound on while my guitar Jenny weeps ah. because Eric didn't want it to sound like Eric he wanted it to sound like the Beatles so that's so the not best a, way of, that's not just a Leslie he's no through? no it's, it's this is it's, it's a it's, manual it's the, oh, manipulation. Yeah. oh yeah and the whole time we were we were doing the four to four or whatever it was. Wow! Like, now that's a was, bombshell. Was Chris doing that. I mean, it's also on the organ at the same time because they were they would it was being done on both things at the same time. Well, that's quite and a so, bombshell. I had always assumed the organs it was going like, out of tune so much because you see all those pictures of this different Fender kind of whirly cabs and stuff that they had in the studio. Then I always assumed it was. Fender Whirly Cabs. Yeah, now, was, the Fender made their own version of a Leslie that was... I don't remember them ever having that. It was oh, always really? a straight Leslie that we used. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm no, My first questions for Ken was one of the questions that got me interested in what the Beatles albums, how they were recorded. Because I was interested in the song Birthday on the White Album. Mm -hmm. Which had this really weird piano sound. And that was literally one of the very first sounds I thought, how can you get that sound? I wasn't trying to duplicate it, but it was just so unusual. Yeah. And I didn't know enough about the equipment at Abbey Road. No one did to realize what piece of gear could get this really weird <laughs> sound. And then, so I kind of thought what it might be and asked Ken about it the first time we met. He's got a good story about that sound on birthday is... It's it's through a voc it's a regular piano. It, for this one part, it needed to be something different. So came up with putting it through, uh, what what was the particular Vox amp? Well, it's it was, probably a, a Conqueror, which is yes. a solid state amp. Yeah. But it's got a mid-range boost knob. It's an MRB. It's MRB, I right. know that so well. So we yeah. just fed the piano through that, recorded it with me turning that in time. <laughs> so, so it's like a stepped wah-wah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like the McRonson sound yeah. almost. It's got a boost in the mid-range yeah. from either a low setting, a middle setting, or a high setting. And it's just manual working the amp, right? Yeah. So turning the knob as the strap plays, turning the amp to, to play along with the music. That's I love that so much, just the idea of... You know the process. You, you had to fight to get things different, like mm -hmm. and that the, to me, it's very boring these days. You want something different. Well, let's just try this plug in. Gonna, let's, not, let's try that one. Yeah, and everyone it's, has the yeah. obligatory hundred and forty-eight plugins yeah. that everyone yeah. uses, and let's record the I, same track as simultaneously through eight different plugins. I, I recently. Yeah. Hello. Somebody can answer the phone. They got it. Hey. I, I recently did uh, a project with uh, a hard rock band called Snoo, S-N-E-W. Yeah. And they, they were uh, being produced by Bobby Ozinski, my co-writer. Mm -hmm. And he, he said to me, hey, do you want to go in the studio and work with me? Any opportunity to get in the studio, yeah. I'm on. Yeah, we wow. went in there. And Bobby's been around the block. He, he, he's worked with quite a few people, uh, engineers and everything. He knows all of them. And he was absolutely blown away how simple I kept everything. Mm -hmm. Just, it, it, we, we did it on Pro Tools. I don't think we used any Pro Tool plugins. Nice. It, it was all uh, analog going to it. And when it came to time to mix, it was, no, it's already done. I didn't have to do anything else. <laughs> and it was, I, I did an interview for, uh, for Joe Benson recently. And he asked me about Snow. And I said, yeah, I, I did that. And we talked a bit about it. He said, yeah, you know, he, if I hadn't have known it was you, I would have been asking everyone who the hell did it because it sounds so 
so much of the day kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's not modern, but it sounds really, really good. Yeah. And it's just, it's... Uh, one of the things for me that is so wrong today is th- the use of reverb. Mm-hmm. We used to use maybe one chamber and an EMT plate mm-hmm. for everything. These days, you, you'll get something in, you'll see how someone's mixed something, and there's a different reverb on every single thing. And it just separates everything so much. Right. Using the one reverb, that it, it just it some, brings everything together Some more. continuity across yes, the track. Yeah. Absolutely. It just, yeah, it, it's weird. There's a couple of... Uh... There's a couple of questions here, but there's something I want to ask you along those lines in okay. a second. Uh, Dusty is asking, Dusty Wakeman, did yeah. Ken like working at the Honky Chateau? Yeah, it, it was it was a little tough that it wasn't quite up to the the Trident uh, standard at that point. We had like uh, no, but it was it was fun. The the desk, I think it was. I can't say homemade, but I don't think it was any major manufacturer. So it, it was <laughs> held it's together by... Uh, yeah, right. It, it was kind of strange. One of the problems that we had, that we had to overcome there, was in recording at, at Trident, they had a drum, a drum booth. And every, as everything was being cut live, a Trident with Nigel or whoever the drummer was with Elton would be in the drum booth. There'd be no problems of pickup, leakage on mm-hmm. the piano. We get to uh, the chateau and there's no drum booth or anything. It's that Nigel would be in the same, exactly the same room. And you got some all around so, things. No, we couldn't. Even that wasn't good enough. So uh, Gus got in some uh, carpenters, local French carpenters, and we had this box made exactly the same shape as the piano. Mm-hmm. About that stood probably about six feet high with a couple of holes in it. We took the lid off the piano, wow. put this over, and I put the mics in through the holes. So we it was an, an ISO box perfect. for yes. the piano. Wow. It worked, it worked perfectly. It was great. Wow. Yeah, you'd never guess from listening to that. And you mentioned Trident. Trident is a studio in London. Uh, it's only about, studio. It's mm-hmm. two blocks from where you were looking for Paul McCartney's office. Yes. Oh, okay. Right yeah. in the middle of that town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The place is still there if you want to walk down this tiny little alleyway. You'll find the studio where they did some Queen records and David Bowie records and Elton and so forth. But Ken left Abbey Road in 1969 to go to Trident, which was a very hip cool modern studio and it's hard to think about this but Abbey Road was a very old uncool big it was the establishment studio yeah. Yeah. yeah so everybody thinks Abbey Road is always the first and the so best so Trident's like and what right school. off of Oxford Street right over there it's off of Wardour Street oh okay yeah. oh right by the old uh, Marquee Club right yeah, I was just up the road from there yeah yeah yeah. 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 Trident was always pushing to have the first 8 track in England the first <laughs> 16 track in England the first anything in England and they were tr- pushing to be ahead of everybody whereas Abbey Road was kind of slow to catch up even to the normal studios because they were so traditional was it the Beatles did a few odd tracks at Trident yeah yeah, yeah. they yeah. you there uh, and wasn't it um, also um, Fixing a Hole um, no or that was at Olympic there's four Olympics. songs from the White Album done there and they also did like I Want You She So Heavy things like that from Abbey Road were down there as well too. Oh, okay. But again, it's a uh, a rare thing that they would step outside Abbey Road. Even rare, you know, even that they would even go outside Studio Two, but they would use other studios at Abbey Road too. Might have been seen as a bit of a betrayal, I but bet, back then. I think uh, I was curious why they went to the Chateau, which was in France. We just mentioned this place called the Honky Chateau as a nickname right. for a French studio, a Chateau de Reville or Strawberry Studios. It was called. Uh, I think Chateau de Reville because that's that was the building. It, it was George. Uh, it was uh, Liszt's France Liszt's place when he was with Georges Sand. It was uh, this chateau just outside of Paris. Wow! So it had a musical history, which is a yeah. great place to do it. Uh, some suppo- good DNA. Suppo- suppo- supposedly some ghosts. <laughs> but uh, the reason we went there was purely for tax. It was at the time there was a uh, yeah. the English tax system was that if you. Six if months? most, if most, no, wasn't that? Is if most of the work was done outside of England, the money, the money generated from that recording could stay in the country where it was recorded, Ugh. unless you brought it into England. Right. Well, Elton had enough in England; he didn't need any more, so it was oh, yeah. recorded in, in France, where the tax was much lower. At we were getting lots country. of good tax exiles over here in the late sixties, oh, yeah. early seventies. Yeah. That's when you know guys like the Stones started yeah. recording over here a yeah. lot for that. And they think they did exile in France. I have a question for you, Brian. Yep. That you may know. You mentioned there are four tracks from the White Album that were right. recorded at Triton. 
Okay, what were they? Ah, the test. No, no, yeah. No, no. Wait, um, dear Prudence. Yes. Um, uh, da da da. Martha, my dear. Martha, my dear. There's one other vintagey one. I'm trying to remember. I've got yeah, pictures know, of them recording the horns. Yeah. That's funny how I, my mind blanks yeah. on those. But um, what's the fourth one? Uh, you know, I can't recall. But we have it written in the book. The, the, the reason, the, 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 no, the reason that I ask is, I think Savoy Truffle, at least the basic track. I remember doing overdubs on it, but I think the basic track was done at Trident. And then the big question is, who played drums on Savoy Truffle? Ah. Because if it was done at Trident, that was before Ringo joined joined the band again. I see. After yeah. quitting. Oh, that's and right. His little uh, hiatus for a moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, did, he, he felt unloved. Didn't Paul it was. do most of the drums? Well, that, I, if, if he played on Savoy Truffle, then he did really good. <laughs> he it, was playing it, over, his, over his head that day. It was a Bernard Purdy. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, no, gosh. it's just, this is something that's, that's come up sort of through interviews and things. Yeah. So I thought, okay, as you'd mentioned four, because I always mention three, because I'm never 100% uh, sure. I was right. The one I couldn't remember was called Honey Pie. Yeah, honey Pie, yeah. Honey so pie, it's yeah. Hey Jude, Dear Prudence, Honey Pie, Savoy Truffle, Martha My Dear, yeah. and I Want You, She's So Heavy. Yeah. Hey Jude was the first uh, thing they'd done there because there was this new eight-track recorder, which was a you know, a cool selling point when you've been stuck on four tracks. Mm-hmm. You're really limited. Eight tracks gives you a lot of options. And so Ken was there at Abbey Road when they were trying to get an eight-track going. But it's hard to have a tax write-off if you have cutting edge gear, right? <laughs> For EMI, everyone will want to work here, and then we'll make a profit. Well, yeah, they just wouldn't allow people there, in there, hardly ever. But it, you know, <laughs> this is why I have this resource written down because I can't yeah. remember much. No, so, so <laughs> yeah, we're, we're in agreement. But what I want to know is who played drums on it. Good question. It, Absolutely. It's, that, What's that the one track? Who? Well, <laughs> we can do some internet research here. Right? I, I don't know that you'll find it. Who played drums on Savoy Truffle? Yeah. Let's I try guess, it just for fun and see what happens. Okay. There's a lot of people with fingers out there typing quickly. I'm sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, there was a question also. Somebody asked about recording Helter Skelter on here. Okay. What, Any you, memories of that? Not really. Yeah. Not really. It, it's for the book. I even went as far as trying regression therapy, hypnotherapy, to try really? and come back with some of the memories. One of, one of the questions I've been asked the most was the recording of, of Eric doing the guitar solo on While My Guitar Jelly Weeps. And I have absolutely no recollection of it whatsoever, nor does anyone else that I know was there at the time. And this has Ringo playing, so that's obviously not right. It's yeah, I know. It, 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 has Chris Thomas playing organ and piano. Well, that's possible, definitely. Yeah. But uh, no, so I wanted to try and remember that session, so I tried regression therapy, and it didn't. It, thus far, it hasn't worked. Maybe I'll try it again and get uh, an Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust Volume <laughs> Two, which would be great. One of the things I like about forgotten chapter, specifically yeah. about Ken's book, and it's it's different. It does say Ken Scott and Bobby Osinski because Bobby wrote as a professional writer, putting paragraphs together and yeah. and making the story flow. Mm-hmm. Most books, as we mentioned before, are they have a name of a person and then there's a name of a second person who did the actual writing. Yeah. Sometimes those people compose and create things to fill in the blanks, but Kim was very careful not to try to do that. And I do adm- admire the fact that they have input from the artists also talking here about the sessions. So when you talk to uh, Terry Bosio from Missing Persons, he tells you what it was like to be there, what it was like to work with Ken. It's not just this patting yourself on the back congratulatory yeah. thing all the way. And Ken also talks in here about Many times screwing up, and many oh, yeah. times also being fired. <laughs> you know, when I when I almost got fired for this and almost got fired for that, because it's not all about how great someone is. It's yeah. about the reality of the ups and downs of the music business. It certainly makes it a much more believable and interesting read when it's not all. Yeah, look how great I am. Yeah, I did read. There's Ken Kelly has a book about the making of rumors, and it's right. wonderful to read from the behind the scenes. I like technical books. I like books that talk about the making of records. To get a sense of being there from him, which is wonderful, but it is his own perspective. I'd love to see what Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks and the assistant engineers right. and the people that rented the studios to them have to say about it too, mm-hmm. so we can get a clearer picture. This has input from a lot of people, uh, Chris Thomas and the White Album, things like that. Chris Klaus Foreman. Yeah, uh, there are people who worked and played on the sessions, uh, giving you a perspective that you feel is fairly fair. It seems nice. Very nice. So, um, <clears throat> without it getting embarrassing. Uh, I have to ask a couple of silly questions. Did, were you a witness to, 
Yoko's bed in the studio? I, 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 <laughs> you know, it may be, but I don't remember it. I it just have to ask the light. I know, I know. Ones. Yeah. That's, it's, it's, I'm kind of overwhelmed with ideas and thoughts of what I want to speak to you about because this has been so absolutely fascinating. There's a general um, question here asking about getting a big drum sound. Any oh, that's right. Any that's what ideas? I was going to ask you about. No guitars, no bass. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't have anyone else in the room. It, as I said earlier, it all starts in in the studio. It's the it's the drum sound has to be right. You can't you can't take a mediocre drum sound, a mediocre any sound, and then make it sound great in the control room. It doesn't matter how many plugins you have. It's get it right in the studio first. Get the tuning right. Getting it played right. Then everything you do to record it from then on is is easy. I I feel so blessed to have worked with all of the artists I have because they have made my life so easy. It's <laughs> I haven't had to struggle too much, which is great. Well, it's, that's very humble, Ken. But you know, it, it takes it, it, it takes someone of talent and ear to reveal what these guys are doing because yes, there's all these uh, examples of fantastic artists who are recorded by the wrong people. And you listen to that record, and you go, I wouldn't have bought that. I, best example I can think of is Van Halen. Van Halen 1 was done note for note, track for track, with Gene Simmons producing the record in New York. And it's horrible. Yeah. God bless you, Gene. But, and they went back with Ted Templeman and some other guys, cut the exact same record out here in L.A., and it's a masterpiece. Yeah. So you're being very humble. And it, that's, it, it's, it's always a team effort. It, it, it's never it one person. That but, was that was the most amazing thing with the Beatles. It was the number one team was the four of them. It was yeah. the the sum of the parts were uh, whatever, greater than uh, yeah, 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 whatever yeah. it was. Uh, the whole was much be- greater than the sum of the parts. That mm-hmm. was it. But they they also had great teams around them with with George Martin, with mm-hmm. Norman Smith, then with with Jeff. Then, it, it, they managed to keep sort of good teams around them. I, th- my personal feeling is that with with Bowie, that the the Spiders team, where where it's him, Rono, Woody Woodman, Z, Trevor Boulder, and myself, we were a great fucking team. Yeah, it, it worked, and it it was remarkably easy. Yeah, and it's always the way. Super Tramp with me. It it was a great team. Mm-hmm. That's what it always is. So, I I, I will take credit. As being part of great teams, and w- yeah. within that, it, it's just made my life so simple. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to acknowledge your humility on there because you're an integral part of these things, and <clears throat> the beauty and the emotion and all these things will not be revealed, will not be highlighted and illustrated correctly without a great engineer and a great producer there. Um, you know, it's a model's a beautiful model, but without the right photographer, you'll never know it. Now, there is something interesting about perspective. When I started talking to Ken and other Abbey Road people about how recordings were made, and I found out that they didn't know crossover frequencies and what compressor that was. It was just called the Altec. We don't know which version Mm -hmm. it is because they were focusing on sound, and that box worked, and it compressed sound, so we use it. They don't care what tubes were in it. They don't care who made the transformers and which way they're oriented. (laughs) So we get very picky about those things because they're focusing on the most important part of the recording, which is the music itself bringing out that part and sometimes the gear helps you sometimes it doesn't matter yeah um, that's true Ken's played at some of his talks you know some of the Bowie tracks you get to hear just the guitar track you get to hear just the vocal yeah and here's the bass track it's a direct box which which was probably thrown together for about five pounds so yeah yeah it, it's like 25 and, bucks and, these days and so. it made yeah. a multi-million selling record yeah. and it's a fine bass sound it won't knock you out but it's perfectly functional but I really think that it's fascinating to hear the perspective from people who have done something that you admire and say, it's different than how we do it now. Maybe you can change your way of thinking. Mm-hmm. One of them was when mixing Bowie records, I was astounded to see how it was done. That David didn't show up. David, really? David wasn't at any of the mixes. He hated being in the studio. He no one bored. was. He really? was. <laughs> no, no one, no one was. was there. Yeah. It was me and a second some of the time. Can yeah. you imagine a band or Mick Ronson saying, go ahead and mix it. We'll listen to it when it's done. Yeah. Well, there's certain, I mean, there was a certain transition, I think, wasn't it mostly due to the Beatles where the artists had any input on the mix at all? Right? Yeah, but don't forget, we, we, yeah, we, with David, Elton was never there, there at any of the mixes. They'd come by at some point towards the end to listen to what we'd done. Uh, 
Right, well, is it, wasn't it a bit earlier than that where it was almost considered inappropriate for the oh, artist to be there at that the, phase? At the beginning of you're, the Beatles, they done. weren't allowed up, yeah. up to the control room at all. There was, there was a yeah. definite barrier. Yeah. There, there were very, very distinct lines between the producer, the engineer, and the artist. Right, and the producer-engineer role now is so blended, it's hard I to imagine that. that. You know, like I would argue that you and Jeff deserved credit. Uh, pr production credits and Never. residuals, no. but it wasn't no. even thought of back then. Right, but yeah. I, I, I would not, not well, for those, it, we, we were there learning our trade, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, yeah fair enough. It, it happened to be the perfect sort of, the perfect storm for learning what That's one right. does. But you just Absolutely. happened to do a fantastic job. I, <laughs> in a way, humble, too, yeah. consider, there's always the argument about a producer, if the drummer says, should we slow down the, the tempo, and everybody agrees to it, does that mean the drummer's the producer? Right, I know. And you can always battle over, did I write something if the producer says, here's a little line on the piano I can put in, did the producer write the song? So no, not yeah. You fragment things a lot, and engineers always make suggestions. They always make the sound of well, the record working with the team, as you said. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was lucky enough, I guess, that uh, I got... Starting off as big as I did with with the biggest band in the world, mm -hmm. uh, what my work became known fairly quickly. I obviously had a particular sound that other people liked, so they would come to me knowing the sound I'd get. I didn't have to go through that early routine of mm -hmm. well, we wanted to sound like this, we wanted to sound yes. like that. It was I was established enough. They, they came, knew what, came to you for the Ken Scott sound, right? Yeah. Uh, but one of one of the things with regard to producers when. When I was a young kid working with George Martin, uh, there were times I couldn't understand why the hell is this guy here? He, he's obviously lost, it has nothing whatsoever to do with it. And it's, over, it's only over time that I've come to appreciate exactly what George did with the Beatles and how important he was. Mm -hmm. he, he had this, this whole thing that talent is there to create. And you as the producer, one variation on being a producer, which is my one, and I think I got it because of George, mm -hmm. uh, is that you allow the talent, the freedom, to create. Yeah. And if they seem to be going a bit too far in one way, it's you can gently nudge them back. Mm -hmm. So you're the shepherd. It, yes, yeah. kind of thing. But yeah. it, it's it's from them. It, it's mm -hmm. from them. I I have worked with produce as an engineer. I've worked with producers that it was. The producer's record; it wasn't the artist, and I, I, that to me is wrong. Yeah, but that's what record companies like because so often those particular producers create hits. Exactly. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. Well, one of the things that you brought up earlier was sort of <clears throat> the modern use of reverb, and I hadn't really thought about that. I think that's very interesting. But one of the things that drives me nuts today about modern recordings versus old recordings is compression. Uh, uh, the, the brick warming, yeah. It's yeah, so it seems to go from ninety-seven percent to a hundred percent in the dynamic range. You know, there's oh wow, you found one that actually came down as low as ninety-seven. Yeah. Wow, that was about twenty years ago. Yeah, right. I was but say, you know, it, it, when you listen to an old recording now, even when I'm in the car, you know, and I'm playing an old recording and I'm driving down the road, I'm like, oh, what's going on? Oh, it's a soft part of the song. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. I mean, everything's kind of mixed for iPods now. Well, so. But what I don't understand is why someone hasn't come up with an app that is a com uh, it's a compressor or a limiter that you the user can put on a track mm. and compress it the way they want it so it suits their listening at that point so that we don't have to set it for them in the first place. That's very funny you mentioned that. <laughs> I have a I have a written down set of notes for an amp that I was like, why don't I just put these circuits aren't that big. You look inside an eleven seventy six or you look inside an LA two A. I could make it this big. Yeah. Why not stick that in an amp? Because half their sessions when I go do sessions for buddies now, I'm plugging right into a compressor. I don't even play through an amp now. I plug and right they, into it. I use one, uh, one of these plugins. Yeah, to, uh, which is a, so yeah. prophylactic. I can't. Oh, I, I, I never can do it well. But yeah. that's what they want. It's okay. But I'm plugging straight into the front of a compressor. And it's like, well, if that's what you want, I can put that right up here. Yeah. You know, it's not a big circuit. I, I, yeah. Just just have an app on the bloody phone or I. I 
Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, Along those lines, I saw yesterday was released a plugin from Aphex, who makes the Aurora Exciter. Right. And you can put it on your phone to run all your music through it and your telephone calls, from what I hear. Yeah. Yes. To, to make your phone go zzz a lot brighter. And it yeah. might be useful on some people's things, but I know that once people hear the comparison, bright and buzzy versus normal, they're going to pick bright and buzzy every time. Yeah. It's just the normal way people listen. That sure. has more excitement to me, whether it fatigues you in the long run. You were talking about compression, and I had a friend who's a... A long time recording engineer in my studio last night, we mentioned Ken was coming on today, and he said, I was at A&M Studios, and they brought me in a control room to listen to Bloody Well Right, which is a song by Supertramp, Ken recorded. And if any of you haven't heard it, get a, a good version of it if you can. I'm sure there's... It's an outstanding recording. I'm sure there's YouTube yeah. and all those things, and it will still hold up in a way, but listen to the song Bloody Well Right on some good headphones or good mm -hmm. quality speakers, and it goes from very quiet to big, big jumps and punches huge jumps in dynamic and he told me last night he said that really changed the way I recorded things because I realized even on pop records where we use compression for a good sound I can still use more dynamics in what I'm recording well, so I, you can I, still be squeezing things but you can still make things get louder and softer absolutely you don't have yeah. to abandon right. compression what a novel concept I know but it, the amazing thing is that we we have that kind of dynamic range when we're still on vinyl and tape. Yes. Which is when it, you had to worry about noise levels. But it was more than now, that. now everything's digital. We don't have to worry about that, and yet we're compressing everything. It's it's ludicrous. And once again, for me, that stems from these bloody conglomerates mm -hmm. that want to control everything. And some sales guy at some point saying, "Well, how come that ad came on and our record wasn't as loud, or played against another record? How come that?" Yeah. We've always had that. We had that back at Abbey Road. Yeah. Uh, with with mastering, we were always complaining. The American records always seemed to be louder, right. even when we were cutting them. Yeah, we would master them, and it they would still say the American version would sound louder. But wasn't they, there different guidelines then, like between no. Britain and America? Because like our RIA or whatever no. was, we would get. You could put more bass well, on our record. No, we would well. get. Uh, 45s. I, I mastered a lot of the Motown stuff, right. which was through EMI at that point. Yeah, and. and quite often the tape would take too long to come over. Mm -hmm. So we'd just literally do a dub from the 45 to tape, and that's what we'd master from. <laughs> so it, it was the identical record, but for some reason it always said the American one sounded louder. Yeah. And it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't louder. It, that, it just sounded louder. Wow. It's, it's that weird thing. But uh, one of the uh, engineers... Uh, from Abbey Road, a guy called Peter Bown came over to America at one point to see what was going on. And his comment when he came back, I think it was Pete Bown, uh, when he when he came back said, the musicians have a different sound in the studio. They're going for something different. Mm -hmm. I, it, but it's always, the grass is always greener. When yeah. we were working on the, on the Beatles, they would have given anything to sound like a Motown record. That's and what yet, I understand. And they yet, envied that yeah, sound a lot. And yet we got uh, a Telex which was, yeah, that shows you how long ago it was, a telex from, uh, from Motown congratulating Abbey Road on the Beatles' success. The telex and how is much the they, first they, version of a fact, Yes, right? well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, congratulating Abbey Road on the, on the success and how they wished they could emulate the, the Beatles' sound. Oh. It's a, it's, it's, the grass is always green. It's a love affair. Yeah. Well, do you think it's a fair statement at a macro level? Because, you know, we're talking about how... You know, you were doing a lots of manual tricks and being creative and pulling things out of your ears, you know, just to try things that, you know, we uh, we mentioned earlier how... I actually pulled most of them out of another part of my anatomy. <laughs> <out of the laughs> yeah, years. you know, yeah, exactly. That would be your nose. Um, but uh, there, you were fortunate to be working during a period of popular music when people were striving for innovation. Yeah, they were stri There was no desire whatsoever to emulate the past. It was I want to do so something radically different that I will go link two Studer machines together and yeah. tweak them like nipples yeah. until I get a happy sound or, or whatever. Um, and now with the season that we're in in music, uh, the the way to create a hit is to remind someone of something they already know. No, absolutely. But one of the problems uh, that talent is going through at the moment is to do with with radio i'd said earlier on about the training at abbey road the way you got to hear and watch how different engineers approach different things from classical to, to dance bands to rock 
back then radio was was very much that way as well mm -hmm. especially in England there was only one sort of radio station which played any form of popular music and a lot of that was more for sort of housewives mm -hmm. rather than rock well, and roll. Well you guys had to you listen to Radio Luxembourg didn't you? Well, yes but that that only really came in badly late at night yeah that wasn't during the day but uh, you'd have to listen to all of these different types of music mm -hmm. a lot of which you'd hate <laughs> but it, it, it sort of stuck there with you and you heard all these different things and so when you later become a musician and you want to do things, you've heard this, you can pull from that. You've yeah. heard this, you can pull from that. Yeah. These days, if you're into hard rock, all you'll ever listen to is hard rock. That's right. If, if you're into rap, all you're ever going to listen to is rap. Yeah, yeah. And it... it, it There's it's, so many it's, fine so, Right, so yeah. it's, gonna, it's just going to... Everything's just going to be regurgitated because you're not hearing anything else to pull from. Right. No stimulation outside right. your little comfort yes. zone there. Yeah, I, that makes perfect sense. There was a unique period in music which they now label fusion, which is actually mm -hmm. the longer term was jazz and rock fusion, meeting the two together. And yeah. so somebody mentioned Mahavishu Orchestra earlier. And I think there's an amazing record Ken worked on called Billy Cobham Spectrum. And if you don't have it, you should probably buy it because... All the rock people love it, and all the jazz people love it. It meets in the middle with some amazing performances by everyone on board. And if you're a rock guitar player, he is, he, Tommy Boland plays on the record. He'll blow your mind with his work on his That's guitar wild. playing, but also he used the Echoplex as a sound oh, effects yeah. device. Yeah. And the drumming is rocking. It sounds like Hot for Teacher from Van Halen, but it's much more nice. progressive and more interesting. But it's a fantastic sounding record, but also it's people in the room playing done fairly quickly. Oh, very. But very. If, if you like rock and roll, it rocks enough for you. Mm -hmm. And if you like jazz, it's experimental and you know performance-wise enough to be good. So I think that those meetings of the things, or the Dixie Dregs doing some of their, uh, yeah, a bit of a country meets rock meets jazz. That's right. Yeah, that's things. Southern fusion. Yeah, and so Dixie people have, have sometimes made that work, whether it be Leonard Skinner or whoever. You can mix things together to create something new, which Absolutely. is always really yeah. unique. Well, Bowie. Right. It's, it's yeah. the classic example. He openly admits, I pull from all other, all over the place sure. and put it together and make it my own. Well, if even look at the White yeah. Album. How many styles of music are yeah. on the White yeah. Album? Right. I mean, you've got ballads. You've got songs that are almost ragtime. You've yeah. got, you know, I mean, it's it's great stuff. It's fantastic. And now that's unheard of. People right. can't get away with it. But that. why do you think that is? It's because talent isn't being allowed to create. It's yeah. being told what to do. And it's, well, this was a hit let's do it again right and, and part of it is people have a fear of well I've got to push my music forward I can't do a funny country song but, but Queen or the Beatles would do one absolutely and so they wouldn't have a fear about oh it's not going to be taken seriously we'll do it you know it'll be fun but and I think that that's the thing with if you're only playing in a garage yeah. for yourself mm -hmm. it, it's you're going to start to get those nerves if you go out and play in front of an audience and play that silly song and suddenly they love it and it's mm -hmm. Wow, well, yeah. this is good. It, it, oh, yeah. it, it, there's that kind of thing as well that, that changes it all. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Where I grew up, I grew up in the middle of the country here in Missouri, if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to fly over. and um, But it's kind of where country and pop and rock and blues all meet. Because um, we have heavy Chicago influence, mm -hmm. heavy New Orleans influence, heavy Nashville influence, heavy hillbilly influence. But then Chuck Berry's from St. Louis. You know, and uh, on the jazz side, uh, what's his name? Uh, Basie, it's from Kansas City. Right. Um, so we got this really nice mix, and when I come out here to the West Coast, and, you know, I was in a band where uh, if we ran out of tunes, we would do These Boots Are Made For Walking by Nancy Sinatra as if Zeppelin were doing it, you know, just for fun. And, sure. And, and, yeah, I don't think, even then, I, that was in the 80s. I don't think you could do anything like that now. People would just go out, time to get a drink. And or time to leave or time to switch the station. It's interesting. Well, I'm hoping, as I'm sure you are, that the cycle is about ready to change. Because there has been, if you look at the cycles, you know, my perspective is you've got you got the country boys singing like black guys, Elvis Presley and Jerry mm -hmm. Lee Lewis, and then Tim Pan Alley took over, and then we had the British invasion, which brought rock and roll back to the United States, and. We got to the late 60s on that, and then it became Bread and the Eagles, which came into disco, and then all of a sudden the Sex Pistols came back over, and it's four guys playing guitar out of their minds, and they kind of brought in the new wave thing, and then we got the Flock of Seagulls and the Cherry Pop stuff again, and then, then we got sort of the Black Crows 
into the Nirvana age. Like, hey, it's four guys playing guitar and it's live, raw, organic performances. That got diluted down again. We had some flashes around the turn of the century for a minute, but then after 9-11, the world wanted safe, comfortable things again, and we're hopefully just starting to come out of that <laughs> again. Like this decade, of, you see like it, you know, a lot of the artists like Lady Gaga, who is a very talented person, but she's doing Madonna. And Bowie, and yeah. it's just Melbourne. regurgitating. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Not she regurgitates it well, but as you, I think we'd all agree on, it's a bit of a product. It's a product of something else. You know, there's not a lot of new stuff going on there. So I'm really hoping she, so. To, to me, she is more popular for being Lady Gaga than for making great records. I think that's I mean, fair. That, yeah. That's the state we're in at the moment. Yeah. Paris Hilton is famous for being Paris Hilton, not yeah. for anything else. Somebody uh, sent me a note the other day. It was one of those pictures, and it had a picture of Beyonce, and it had a picture of Freddie Mercury. Oh, yeah. I and it said, you know, yeah. seven songwriters, four producers. Yeah. And the lyrics were, oh, baby, you baby, me baby, yeah. will baby. And then it had Freddie Mercury, one songwriter, one producer, with, is this the real life or is this just fantasy? Yeah. You know, going on and on and on. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that cycle again. And I'm forgetting power pop. Okay, thank you, Justin. <laughs> Well, look, we're at two hours now, and part of the tradition of coming on the show is it's called Lunch with Dan Bull, so we haven't had lunch yet, So, and uh, Brian told me you're a fan of Indian food. Absolutely. So we've got a pretty decent place right over here on, I on Lancashire, so. yes. and, and if you'll allow me, I'd love to buy you lunch for, be great. for coming on and spending some Amazing. time with Thank us, because it's been quite an honor. So let me do sort of a last call here, because um, I, I, I'm going to bug you to come back if, you, no, if you'd be it. so gracious. Absolutely. And um, I want to read. I'm eager to read this book now. So I have to go watch my daughters ride horses this afternoon. So I'm going to open it up and sit there at the barn. Oh, that's not fair. Well, yeah, it's that's okay. <laughs> Here's some nice pictures from the book, Ken's book. <laughs> Whoops, there we go. Some Bowie session stuff down here. Super Tramp on the other side. And then up there's Billy Cobham. That record I told you about, Billy Cobham Spectrum, is a great one to check out. Really great music. Very nice. Well, once I become a little more uh, educated on your past, then I can maybe ask you some better questions. And, yeah, there and, are uh, no bad questions. Yeah, we can have... Well, I want to make one it... that's not asked, I think. That's right. Goes, isn't it? Is there any question you haven't been asked before? Uh, not that one. Um, so, let me do sort of a last call here. Is there... There's my phone. Oh, it's Karnig Manukia again, calling from 310. It's a Beverly Hills call, must be. Um, so looking forward to the return. So, are there, guys, are there anything you want? There's about a 15 second delay here, so they they don't. And if you know this guy who's calling, please let him know that we're busy. Um, wow, well, we got all dark back here, is that because we're not focused? Oh, my camera sucks. Anyway. Uh, are there any questions you guys want to throw out before we call it a day? I've kept these people here for two hours already, which it feels like 20 minutes, to be honest. Depends which side of the desk you're on. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. What about, Ruth? What about recording with people who are losing their hearing? Have you had that with any of your hard rock bands or loud bands or... I have no, that a lot with they've my had, They've had it with me, actually. But, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, luckily, that's one thing that hasn't hit me. But uh, Yeah, isn't Sir amazing. George struggling oh, with massive very, hearing oh, yes. loss? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, he's got shame. Giles to help him. And, yeah. Yeah, because at one point I heard he was almost stone deaf. But then you watch the documentaries, he, he appears to be yeah. hearing things. He's, he's dealing with it. Yeah. He's dealing with it, but... Uh, no, more often than not, he has Judy, his wife, that you'll say something to him and then she'll tell him. Oh, somehow, like yeah. That. But, uh, so, uh, Eric Yar is asking, did the Beatles ever record at Air Studios? No. Paul did. I don't know if any of the others did. It wasn't built in time. No, uh, no not as the Beatles. I'm just thinking yeah. afterwards. Sure. I know Paul did quite a sure. bit of stuff because he was working with Jeff a lot, who was staff at Air at the time. Yeah. Uh, and also, no. did, did you do Ichiku Park? No, that was Glenn, I think. Yep. Glenn then, with Eddie Kramer was second on it. And then the flanging was done by another engineer who happened to mess around with the trick. Who was it? Do you um, remember? Yeah, George Chikans. Oh, yeah. Who I think is okay. a fantastic engineer who worked on some Led Zeppelin, but he's not well known. No. 
Ah. And he did the, the Ichiku Park is famous for having this beautiful flanging sound. If you look it up oh, on yeah. YouTube, you can see the song and hear the flanging. It's really big flanging. Actually, that was phasing. Right, it is phasing, exactly, yes. yeah. And it's really, really big It's sound. extreme, yeah, but they do it very artfully. It's very psychedelic. Yeah. Which was the era. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't even talk about LSD, did we? No. <laughs> it's their whole world. That's horrible. Okay, guys. Well, I think we should wrap it up. Uh, it's just been fascinating and interesting, and I'm so honored that you came here. And My pleasure. And so flattered. Absolutely, and I'll be back. And let's Absolutely. hold this up again. So you're going to be over at the Grammy Museum next... July 19th. Next, next Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. I'll be there. And cool. um, for all, there's a lot of local guys here. Um, so come by and meet Ken. And... Um, Tell him that you saw him on my show and he'll write something dirty in your book, I guess. Hmm. No? <laughs> no? Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. Thank you again, my Ken. Pleasure. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank Brian, you thank you, me. sir. It's good Welcome. to have you back. You know, Brian's becoming a regular here on this. Maybe we should make it the Dan, Brian, Brian, and Dan <laughs> show. It's all local. In fact, Ken spent a lot of time in this neighborhood. There was a studio called Chateau Recorders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Ken moved here in the mid-70s and they were just half a mile from here. Did a lot of records there. All right. Very lived, on, nice. lived on pizza from Dino's on oh, Burbank yeah. and... Uh, Dino's is still there. Yes, I know. Oh, very <laughs> nice. For, for at least two years, nothing but pizza, except on Sundays when I have the day off and have an English roast. Wow, um, you look surprisingly healthy for a life of pizza. Yeah, tomato is... The stewed tomato <laughs> is supposed to be very good for males. Very and, nice. Now, when, when did you move over here? Are 76. You, and you've stayed since? Yeah. Wow. For a little longer. A little longer. Are you going to go home? I want to, yeah. Yeah? I mean, yeah. My wife most certainly does. Very, one of those very strange things, and I was wrapping it up. Uh, I'm in my second marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, she's American. She has two sons, my stepsons now. But just one of those very strange... She's a nurse. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with the music. Just, by the way, she says hi. Uh, <laughs> N nothing really to do with the music business but it turns out I have three daughters their godfather is Billy Cobham one ah. of the most amazing drummers yes. my stepson's godfather is Billy Sheehan one of the most amazing bass players <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have so the god band yeah, yeah. Right. right yeah the Billies yeah I, that's the other weird thing it's, it's two Billies as well two Bills very nice yeah, I was going to try to go to London this summer and completely forgot that the Olympics. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there. I have the, a, the Olympics and bad storms at the moment, it seems. Yeah, yeah, you're getting you're getting nice weather as well. Well, is that where you plan on going back to London? or are you just? Uh, no, outside somewhere. Yeah. It's lovely. I miss it so much. I've only been back a couple times since yeah. I lived there. But, yeah, that was the thing that I still walk away with, exactly what you said, is live music is sought out and welcome now. Yeah. And I, as I was making the point, of, I had two gigs that were within walking distance. I could carry a little well, lamp and, and, and a guitar and, and go. They're so much more open over there. Like, mm -hmm. the, the Killers had to go over there to, to get a record yeah. deal. Uh, the Scissor Sisters, still huge throughout the world, but most people from America, yeah. although they're a New York band, right. most people in America have never heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, you live in L.A., so you know, but you go to a gig here, it's full of people sitting like this. Oh, you can only, yeah. Have you ever seen someone get up and dance at a rock and roll gig in L.A.? But I never had a gig in London where people weren't dancing. Right. You know, even if we were playing like crap, yeah, yeah. we're rocking and rolling, yeah. we're having a good time, this is really fun. That's because they drank over there. Yes. <laughs> the pints were a-flowing, that's for sure. Well, okay, guys. Well, we're getting lots of thank yous here. Oh, and my pleasure. Thank you for watching. Thank you, guys. And um, I'm going to go ahead and kill the stream right now. Bye. Oops. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. They have to hold up the walls. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Dan. Right on. Thank you, guys. It's always quite a pleasure to have you guys. We dance up here. Justin's in San Francisco. Do you guys really dance at rock and roll gigs in San Francisco? Yeah. Take you to other things than drink. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. All right, fellas. Thank you again. Thank you again, Brian and Ken. And uh, we'll see you next week. Take care.